Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this exciting roundtable on the possibilities of Opportunity Zones. I'm Robin Keegan, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Development in HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development. I want to thank everybody for joining this virtual roundtable. As some of you know, it has taken a bit of extra time and effort to get here, as have many things this past year. To that end, I would like to take a moment to thank the HUD CPD and Field Policy and Management Region 4 staff for their assistance in coordinating this event. I'd also like to extend a thanks to the staff from Enterprise who has supported the development of this webinar and will be sharing their expertise with us over the course of the, of the next two days. I would also like to thank all of the speakers and panelists who I know you will learn a lot from over the course of this event. It's an understatement to say that over the past year, communities across the country and the world have experienced unprecedented challenges, unlike anything we've had to contend with before. As we move slowly from rapid response, we can now begin to set our sights on economic recovery. Recovery, as you know, will require new and innovative strategies, including new funding sources and capacity, which is why HUD has partnered with Enterprise on this event. HUD is committed to providing communities with the resources they need to respond to and recover from this monumental crisis. The purpose of this event is to introduce the tools you need to utilize opportunity zone investments within your communities to achieve your community's purpose, vision, and goals. We view Opportunity Zones as an instrument for place-based development that encourages public-private partnerships to deliver positive outcomes for neighborhoods. When paired with HUD CPD funds and other funding, Opportunity Zones can enable transformative projects that have the power to revitalize whole communities, especially those most vulnerable and underserved. It's imperative at this time that we be bold and creative as we combine public and private resources in pursuit of creating opportunity for all. We want to ensure that our grantees are able to access all of the development tools available in our toolkit and in their communities to make your vision of your community come to light. This means having information required to take a leading role in opportunity zone projects to ensure, ensure that they achieve community benefits with a focus on advancing racial equity and environmental justice, sparking the innovation of small businesses and entrepreneurs, creating quality, good paying jobs for low income residents, providing housing and other direct impacts to individuals currently residing in opportunity zones. We're here to support you in your effort as HUD grantees to leverage again, CPD grants and other funding sources with opportunity and in zone investments. Here in Region 4, we have some great examples of these investments fostering social impacts. In Birmingham, the nonprofit operator, Mason Music Foundation, will restore the historic Woodlawn Theater into live music venue for concerts, weddings, and community events. They are also using this opportunity to provide scholarships and other resources to the community for music learning um, and other arts endeavors. Another project in downtown Birmingham will rehabilitate the American Life Building, which has stood vacant for nearly three decades. They will create 140 units of workforce housing with 10 units allocated to individuals returning from the criminal justice system. They're doing this with a combination of opportunity zones, investments, municipal, state, federal, and other funding sources for the project. HUD will continue to offer tools, resources, and technical assistance to support community-driven investments like these in Opportunity Zones. I invite you to view HUD's current Opportunity Zones resources on our Opportunity Zones website, including the recent December 2020 HUD Opportunity Zone webinar series and two Opportunity Zone tools Links to those resources can be found in the shared box account for this event. Please also take some time to review CPD Notice 2006 guidance on using HUD CPD funds in Opportunity Zones. We also want to hear from you, which is why we're here today, and we've built time into the agenda to 
for you to give us your feedback, ask your questions, and brainstorm with us about innovative opportunities to use these tools combined with other financial investment tools to, again, make the vision of your community as you grow that stronger. Together, we have the ability to improve the livelihoods of our most vulnerable residents and improve wealth creation opportunities within our underserved communities. I look forward to learning with you over these two days and to continuing the journey to increase economic opportunity within your communities. Thank you again for coming today. And I wanna just hand it off to Jonathan Tarr with Enterprise to talk about some logistics for the day. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Robin, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I just want to review brief, briefly the IT logistics and some housekeeping items so everyone is aware of how the webinar will work. Um, Orlando, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to do that? Oh, go ahead and share your screen. That's fine. Here I go. Uh, in response to many questions we received already, uh, we will we are recording this. So uh, we will make sure that everyone who has registered um, is able to get a recording after the fact. Can you all see that now? There we go. So uh, at this point, the chat feature is disabled for all participants and attendees are muted. If you would like to ask a question at any point, you can uh, use the uh, Q&A button, which includes the little speech bubble icons on the bottom of your screen to type in a question at any point, and we'll address those during the Q&A sessions. Uh, during, the, during the actual panel discussions, you may also use the raise hand feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen as well. Let's see. Do you all want me to share the other screen? I'm almost done. Sorry for the little snafu here. Um, so when it's your turn to ask a question to your panelist, uh, the webinar moderator will unmute you and call on you to ask your question verbally. Uh, if you're not connected to the audio, uh, you could, of course, just type in your question in the Q&A panel. And uh, if you are asking questions verbally, we encourage participants to turn on their camera when they're asking panel, panelists questions. Uh, so I think that covers it. Apologies if I'm sharing, if I was sharing the wrong screen, but I hope I got everything. And um, from here, can I go ahead and hand it off to my colleague, Orlando Velez at Enterprise, and he will kick us off. Good morning. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, everybody. So uh, just to reiterate, we want to welcome everyone to our uh, roundtable discussion today. Uh, and do want to remind people that on our roundtable discussion, uh, the second half on Thursday, uh, it is a different registration link. So if you have not registered, please go ahead and do that. So, uh, so I'll introduce uh, Joey Bayetti. Um, and he is from the Community Planning and Development Specialist uh, from HUD. Uh, and he will be talking uh, to us about the role of CPD funding in opportunity zones. Um, after uh, his presentation, we'll take questions and answers through the Q&A box. Uh, as Jonathan had mentioned, the Q&A box uh, is down in the toolbar at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, please go ahead and type in the questions that you wish to ask Joey uh, during the Q&A session, and uh, we'll try to get to this as we can. Joey, I'll hand it off to you. Awesome. Thanks, Orlando. Can you remind me how much time I have? Sure. We have uh, 30 minutes. Okay, perfect. So. I am going to share my screen and this is gonna work flawlessly. Um, so how is that? Thank you, good. Okay, perfect. Um, I think it's asking me for subtitles. Okay, um, is there any way that I could remove those subtitles really quickly? I'll take care of it, Joey. Okay, thank you, they were a little distracting. Um, okay, 
Well, thank you everybody again for joining. Um, my name is Joey Baietti. I am in the Community Planning and Development Department at HUD. I used to work in the Financial Management Division, uh, managing the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program. And I was wondering if I would be able to see the participants, but it doesn't look like it, I don't think. Um, okay. Well, I was going to ask you all to a few questions to show me uh, a raised hand or two, but I think we'll just go ahead um, and move forward. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how to utilize CPD funds in in opportunity zones. So just ways that we have been thinking about it here at HUD um, and then throughout the rest of the event, hopefully you'll keep what you learned from this presentation in mind and start to come up with different ideas for how you might utilize your own CPD funds in opportunity zones. So to get started, we'll start off with uh, introducing home funds. So home funds can be used as an anti-displacement tool in opportunity zones. So they can be used um, to help the economic or physical di displacement of low income folks um, who live in opportunity zones. And that's through home buyer assistance or through home rehab assistance. Um, the, and also home funds can be used as additional leverage in opportunity zone projects. So we'll get to a little later in this presentation about how to utilize your CPD funds either to attract opportunity zone investment or to support opportunity zone investment. So home funds is um, another way that you can support and also attract investment. In terms of the housing trust fund funds, we think about this as um, providing, providing assistance that can be used for rental housing. Um, so most of 80, about 80% of HTF funds have to be used for rental housing, but they may be used for the production or preservation of affordable housing in this way. So through acquisition, new construction, reconstruction, or rehab. And also um, HTF funds can be used to pay operating costs for HTF assisted properties. So that could be another way to support uh, keeping folks inside the opportunity zone. So we're actually supporting those who live in the zone and not necessarily always attracting new or outside individuals. So um, I'm going to move into talking a little bit about the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program just to give you an overview of how the program works, uh, since some of you may be less familiar with this specific program. But Section 108 is a loan guarantee program, so it provides loans, uh, not grants. First thing to think about, it uses the same framework as the CDBG program. So that's national objective and eligible activities. It shares a lot of the similar eligible activities as CDBG funds, but think of Section 108 as um, for physical infrastructure projects. So conserving your limited CDBG funds for those public services projects or non-revenue generating projects and keeping Section 108 for those big infrastructure projects. Um, it's also low cost non competitive funds that's available on a rolling basis. So wide range of uses for section 108 like I talked about it uses similar eligible activities as the CDBG program. It's very low cost financing with very flexible terms, so we will work with our borrowers throughout the process to make sure that we're um, we're aligning our requirements with and terms with what best suits the project in the in the borrower. Various sources of repayment and collateral. So HUD accepts various sources of repayment from project revenue to CDBG, uh, other revenue, and similar with collateral. And the funds are available on a rolling basis. So there's no specific deadline. Um, you could apply at any time throughout the year. And once you go through the um, con plan amendment process, that's kind of the only uh, major step before you can submit an application. So grantees can borrow up to five times their, max, their maximum CDBG allocation. So here's a way to think about it here. You borrow up to five times your maximum CDBG allocation. Um, you take out your any outstanding Section 108 commitments or loan balances, and then you arrive at your available borrowing capacity. 
but you can also just find this information on our website. So you don't have to worry about any of the calculation aspect of it. Um, so to take you through the process a little bit. So first you wanna start by selecting your, your projects and then you go through the public comment period or we call this the pre-application phase. So like I mentioned before, you have to do a comp plan amendment. So you start through your public comment period and then you would submit the application to HUD. And then after a, some pass back between the HUD team and the applicant at this point, then you go, you move through the approval process. And then after the official approval of the commitment, that's when the, the project is accepted and HUD commits to guaranteeing the amount of funding that is requested. Then you move through the financing phase. And this is where we come up with all the loan documents and um, we move forward with actually being able to advance the funds. And after the funds are advanced, then we move on to the administration. And this is just documenting compliance or tracking project outcomes. And section, one, section 108 uses IEAS just like CBG. Um, so I just wanted to throw this slide in here to show you all how when combined with CDBG, Section 108 can really be used at all, um, all phases of a project. So you have your pre-development phase, the acquisition, site prep, and we'll get into those with opportunity zones, particularly acquisition, site prep with demolition, that could come in handy. Um, the implementation phase, so we have working capital or purchase of machinery and equipment, which could be particularly useful again for opportunity zone projects. And then while Section 108 can't um, do most of these activities, when can, like I was mentioning, when combined with CDBG, you have job training, you have um, home buyer assistance, and those more public services as well. Um, so there are two ways to utilize the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program. There's the project-specific way, which means you apply to the program for a specific project. So you're thinking about maybe doing a rehabilitation on a community park. And so that's a specific project. You would apply to HUD. Um, you'd give us project details in your application, and you'd work through the project um, and from the application phase to the underwriting to the financing. You could also apply to Section 108 to create a loan fund. And so this would be um, maybe borrowing a larger commitment and then you would wanna do maybe small business lending. So you would take out a larger Section 108 commitment and then you would make individual smaller loans from that loan fund. So in this, this type of approach to using Section 108, the application isn't necessarily describing your specific activities, it's more describing the general idea of what you want to do and what types of projects you want to fund with the loan fund. This, um, this approach to using Section 108 is ideal if you want to target resources in a specific area. So thinking about opportunity zones, if you wanted to support small businesses in opportunity zones, you may want to think about doing a small business loan fund um, or others, other type of loan fund um, for that specific geographic area. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit just kind of the flow of funds um, since it can be somewhat complicated. So we'll break it down a little bit here. So say the borrower here, let's just use Atlanta. Atlanta would apply to HUD for Section 108. When um, Atlanta receives the approval from HUD, then what we do is we work on the loan documents. And so the first step, like I mentioned uh, in the financing phase, is creating all those loan documents. When the loan documents like the contract and the note are finalized, then Atlanta would say, okay, I'm ready to draw down funds and start the project. So then they would submit an, an advance request to HUD. HUD would then take the note uh, and provide our federal guarantee, which gets you access to the very low interest rates. And we, we send that to the lender, who in this case would be a bank. So Atlanta here doesn't have to worry about going out to find their own lender. You just work with HUD and then HUD will do all of the finding of the lender on the back end. So we work with um, a bank for this specific program. So then the lender will advance the funds directly to Atlanta in this case. So the lender here would provide the financing to Atlanta without Atlanta having to interact most with the lender. 
And then Atlanta would loan the funds to a third party, let's say a developer in this case. And so Atlanta is relending the funds to the developer. The developer would then repay Atlanta, who would then repay the lender in this case. So it seems like somewhat of a uh, complicated system, but really what I wanted to show here is that the money is actually coming from the lender, in this case, the bank, and not from HUD directly, though the city will work with HUD directly. So unlike other federal programs, uh, federal loan guarantee programs, where you have to go out and find a lender, you don't have to do any of that with Section 1. Um, so the cost of the financing, there are two, there are two um, financing structures in Section 108. So the first is interim financing, and that's available um, through in between our public offerings. And the cost of that is the three month treasury bill auction rate plus 35 basis points. And when I last looked it up, that was 0.37. So the money is really cheap right now. And then the, the other way of providing financing is through our permanent financing, but we only offer permanent financing about once every three years when we go through a public offering, but that's when you can lock in your competitive fixed rate financing. So um, this is just to show you that Section 108 and to that to Section 108, CDBG and HOME actually can all be thought of as sort of in this way where you, they could be used as standalone financing. So the whole project can only consist of Section 108 funds, or it could be layered into the capital stack, or it could be used to provide kind of that last little bit of financing that we call gap financing. This slide's a little old, but I just wanted to put it in here to show you that when combined with your CDBG funds, Section 108 really allows you to leverage that CDBG allocation and really get the most for that allocation. Uh, Section 108 works well with all of these other financing sources from different our uh, federal partners. So some of the ones to highlight here are new market tax credits, historic tax credits, um, a lot of our SBA funding, and uh, any sort of funding that you're getting from EPA or DOT. So if you wanted to consider combining Section 108 with uh, these other federal financing sources, come to HUD early on in the process and we can let you know where the best fit would be for the Section 108. So a little bit more about combining Section 108 with other financing sources is it, it works well with um, mixed use development. So both Section 108 and CBG can work well with uh, mixed, use de mixed use developments, but it's about allocating the funds to the parts of the project that meet our program requirements. So thinking about allocating the CDBG or Section 108 to the ground floor com commercial component of the project rather than the new housing above. So some of those things is uh, good to think about early on in the project, and that's why it's good to involve HUD early on. There are also some limitations on using Section 108 with federal tax exempt bond financing. So this comes into play a lot with 4% LIHTC, but there is a way um, that HUD works with our uh, legal with our legal counsel and the city's legal accounts counsel to provide a legal opinion that um, the bonds for 4% LIHTC are private activity bonds. So if this is something that comes up um, for you all or you're thinking about maybe combining Section 108 or CDBG, or well, in this case, Section 108 with 4% LIHTC, just bring HUD in early on and we can, we can walk you through that process. So to focus in on opportunity zones, we think about using opportunity, Section 108 and CDBG and to some extent HOME and HTF uh, can be used as a resource to prepare sites to attract opportunity zone investment. So there are 8,700 plus opportunity zones. Um, there is a lot of opportunity zone funding, but it's still going to be somewhat competitive in that you're going to have to kind of go out there and attract opportunity zone investment. And so one of the ways to think about doing that would be to do a uh, analysis of sites in your opportunity zone that are ready for ready for investment or ready for development and to go out and create those pad ready sites with your CDBG or Section 108 funds so that when the opportunity zone investment comes in, they can get started immediately on the project. 
We also think of uh, um, using CDBG in Section 108 as a way to supplement opportunity zone equity. So this is kind of that more traditional sense of layering, layering in the CDBG in Section 108 directly into an opportunity zone project. And then the last way we think about it is as a resource to complement opportunity zone projects. So if you think about it, your CDBG or Section 108 doesn't necessarily have to go directly into an opportunity zone project that's receiving opportunity funds. It could be a way, um, you could think about it as a way to just support the project. So um, maybe there's a huge multifamily development that's going to be going into an opportunity zone and you want to use your CDBG or Section 108 to help businesses expand into that zone now that there's going to be new residential there. Or maybe you want to redevelop a park in the area. Um, so we also think that state and local governments should take a more active approach with opportunity zone investment. We really want to see you all getting in on the ground level of these projects and making sure that you're directing some of the outcomes. And so some of the ways we think about doing that is, uh, like I mentioned, I identify sites that are ready for opportunity zone investment. So you can think about doing some sort of analysis of buildings that are ready for rehab or maybe empty lots that you have. And you could use your Section 108 or CDBG funds to prepare those sites for, for development. Um, similar, you can look for ways to complement opportunity zone projects. Um, and we sort of talked about that a little bit already. So if you know what types of opportunity zone projects are gonna be going into the zone, then you can utilize your CDBG or Section 108 funds to make sure that you're building projects that are complementary to whatever the Opportunity Zone project is. We also can think about ways to identify a plan for in infrastructure to be rehabilitated. So Section 108 and CDBG can be used for public utilities um, and public facilities. So if there is any work that needs to be done with installing uh, public utilities, you could do that work ahead of time with your CDBG or Section 108 funds. We also encourage our local government partners to streamline different local government processes or think about ways that you can make sure that the zoning of the opportunity zone aligns with what type of development you want to see there. So taking care of some of that stuff up front early on will allow these projects to go more smoothly. Um, so we think about what another way to support opportunity zone projects would be to build that attractive financing stack. So Opportunity zone funding is not going to be able to pay for the entirety of a project. And so you want to make sure that you have available different other fi financing sources. So that's where Section 108 and CDBG comes in and then any other local financing that you can find, philanthropy, things like that. Um, working with your, with your local government partners to create federal funding packages. So thinking outside of your area, maybe um, pulling in other regional resources as well. And then also introducing other tax incentives or um, tax increment financing, things like that. Orlando, are you cutting me off? No, I'm just uh, um, asking you, we've had some questions um, come through. If oh, you yeah, could slow yeah, down. yeah. Oh, if you could slow down a little bit, please. I oh, think, sure, uh, sure. There's a lot of really great information in here. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I'm talking fast because you worried me with the 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> we want to let's maybe let's take a five minute break and answer some questions. Uh, that's right now the only question that we have. We did put in the chat that if you do have any questions, uh, okay. please use the Q&A box. So okay. Well, I am sorry, team, for going fast. It's really hard with this virtual environment. I can't like see any of you or really get a sense of like how you're interpreting this information. So um, I'm happy to go back at, at the end, go back through slides and things like that. So take note of anything that I went to went through too quickly and we can go back and um, go over it again. Um, but I will try and slow down. So um, one of the tips that I wanted to leave you all for streamlining the HUD requirements uh, is our talking a little bit about our neighborhood revitalization strategy area. So as you all, I'm sure are aware or who have heard, the Opportunity Zone tax incentive doesn't really come along with a lot of reporting requirements. Um, a lot of the requirements more have to do with the funders who are trying to seek the incentive and less for the project itself. And so one of the ways that we think that 
you all can have a big role in opportunity zones is really making sure that these projects do have that social benefit and that that socially optimal outcome and they're not just um, you know getting returns for the investors. So one of the ways that we um, think that you could streamline the federal reporting requirements since the opportunity zones don't really have their own requirements you don't want to tack on a bunch of other additional requirements we think that um, it could be good to think about a neighborhood revitalization strategy area plan in your opportunity zone so either a portion of it or at the whole zone you can also get designated as an nrsa um, but I guess before we get into that, sorry, I jumped ahead myself. Uh, the Before you even get your neighborhood vitalization strategy area plan or think about that designation, opportunity zones just um, by way of being an opportunity zone and being um, a high poverty area may qualify for HUD's presumptive benefit. Um, so I'm not sure if you all are aware of the presumptive, presumptive benefit, but in um, areas, we do it by block groups or census tracts that have a poverty rate of 20% or higher, um, slightly higher if you're in the central business district, then all jobs in that area can be considered LMI without having to document any of the income. So this would mean that you could choose the area benefit activity instead of doing LMI, where you would have to then track the, the income for all the employees hired. So now jumping into an NRSA, and like I was saying, really consider getting your opportunity zone also designated as an NRSA so you could get some of these streamlined reporting requirements and it's easier for you all to do all your documenting and reporting and that kind of makes the, using the federal financing even more attractive to an outside investor. So an NRSA gives you the same benefits as the presumptive benefit where you're kind of using the area benefit national objective instead of the jobs national objective because all the jobs are presumed to be LMI. It also allows you some flexibility with housing rehab projects. So where you could do a, an aggregated 51% uh, low mod benefit as opposed to the 100% uh, when you're doing single family rehab projects. Uh, and then it could also allow you to do more public services uh, and social services in the area because it allows grantees to um, to go beyond their public service cap in the or in the neighborhood revitalization strategy and uh, this last component is that the designation lasts five years and can be renewed so you would work with your field office to get the designation re renewed but you really would want to kind of think of the neighborhood revitalization strategy area and maybe to that to some extent the opportunity zone itself in kind of what can we accomplish in five years. Uh, here is an example of a community that utilized section 108 and opportunity zone funding. Um, so in Atlantic City and County, they did a small business loan fund that where they combined section 108 and opportunity zone funding for a boardwalk restoration project. So supporting multiple small businesses along a, a boardwalk in uh, Atlantic City. Um, here is just a little bit more about the project and how the city and county combined their efforts and the, just a little bit, a little snapshot of the capital stack there at the bottom. So a couple of th takeaways. Uh, so know your zone, really get familiar with your opportunity zone or zones, know um, kind of the demographics of the zone, what are some of the key development goals of the zone or where you would like to see the, the zone go. Um, know how much you have at your disposal. So thinking about your CPD pot of money, what, how much section 108, can you leverage? How much CDBG do you have available or could be, could be made available? Um, thinking about your home funds and your HTF funds and different types of projects that you would allocate that funding to. And then be proactive and make sure that you are at the table with these projects because it's not always clear that developers will come in and involve the city as much as they should. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your area. It's you know, your neighborhood you're working for there. So make sure that you have a seat at the table and you're, you're helping to direct some of these projects. 
Um, I'll just kind of showcase a, a few resources for you all. So in terms of Section 108, there's a bunch of resources out there on the website that are available to you. The application tool is probably the most helpful when trying to put together an application. Um, there are some other tools that I think are also helpful, including a couple of underwriting guidelines. So uh, if you had questions about a specific resource or needed to be directed, please let me know. Um, and then the Financial Management Division, the office that manages the Section 108 program, they are very open to providing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance at any stage of the project. So just going from the beginning stages of the project, walking through the eligibility requirements, offering any suggestions for how to layer in the Section 108 financing to the application, uh, working with the field, working with the office and the field office to actually build your application and to make sure it has all the information necessary uh, to get through approval. Um, again, just helping clarify any outstanding questions, um, make, making sure that we're all clear on the underwriting. And then through the financing phase, this would be identifying that additional piece of collateral, um, working through any financial questions that you all may have and then all the way into the implementation phase. So going through any sort of reporting requirements or documentation and things like this. So here's my contact information and the Section 108 website. Again, you'll have all of these slides and I will pause here to answer any questions. Thank you, Joey. Uh, we did have a couple of questions come through. Um, w. Calvin Anderson had a question on how do opportunity zones in Section 3 portal opportunities work together? Opportunity zones in Section 3? Was that the question? Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not the HUD uh, subject matter expert on Section 3, so I, I don't think I would be the best person to answer that question. I would probably want to pass it over to anyone on the field office who might have a better idea about section three. So that would be one that I'd want to maybe uh, take down and kind of answer later afterwards. Okay, great. Um, we had another question from Veronica Rebels. Uh, how do I know where the opportunity zones are in my locale? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are a couple of different mapping sites that have mapped all the opportunity zones. Um, so. I think even Enterprise 360 is a, a mapping mapping tool. Novogradic also has a mapping site. So if you uh, kind of just Google generally, um, you know, mapping opportunity zones, you should be able to pull up a GIS tool from uh, from uh, any number of organizations, and they will be able to map the opportunity zones. So if you go to your city, it'll outline where the opportunity zones are. And perhaps we can even provide a link to one of those tools in the box. Thank you. Those are all the questions that we have right now. Okay. And then, so I have a little bit more time though, right? Yes. Yes, because we right now we have, um, we can go into the break with you. Uh, where you just host questions and answers. Uh, and we could take live questions here at this point too. So attendees want to ask a live question uh, directly to Joey, um, feel free to raise their hands uh, and we can go ahead and unmute you. Yeah, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, I think maybe, so, uh, and I'll go back through talking about this slide and just, I think what we're trying to do with this event is really help um, give you all the tools and resources that you need to start thinking about ways to utilize CPD funding in opportunity zones to help um, attract opportunity zone investment, but then also be the one who is directing that investment. So I've talked a little bit about, you know, making sure you have the seat at the table. And so what we're trying to think about is what is one of the ways that you can ensure that you have a seat at the table? That's by putting some skin in the game in these projects. And you do that by, putting in some money. So CDBG, Section 108, home funds can all be available sources to you to utilize in these projects to show, hey, we are interested in this project. Um, we wanna show that we 
are willing to put in our own investment as well. Um, and then that way you can really leverage to the, to the, mo to the maximum ability opportunity zone investment. So thinking about throughout this, the course of this event, thinking about projects that you may have in mind, and if you ever want to workshop them or ask a question about a specific project and just kind of run it by us, like, would this be eligible or does this sound like it would be a good use of the, of the funding for this project? Um, we're happy to do that at any time. So uh, please feel free to jot down any project ideas or anything like that. And then when we have these breaks, you can, um, you could ask me or any one of the HUD staff. So with that, I guess we can maybe go, go to our first break. Yeah, we have a couple more questions coming through. Okay. Um, the Matt and Ojala, uh, is it permissible to place section 108 funds into a quality opportunity fund managed by a third party? Yes. Um, so we are actually working on, we're working on a structure that we're trying to approve with Arcteris um, currently, but yes, that would be a, a, an eligible use of the funds, just as long as the end use of the funds meets a program uh, requirement. So thinking about you would loan the, you would loan the section 108 to the loan fund, and that would act as sort of your loan fund. Um, even though it's an opportunity zone fund. And so any project that is funded from that loan fund would have to be eligible, if that makes sense. So thinking about uh, economic development, then you would want to create jobs. So as long as the end result of that project was creating jobs or delivering services to low income individuals, then that would be an eligible use of the fund. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question from George Mensa. Um, are there any specific incentives or regulatory relief to the use of CPD funding uh, in opportunity zones? So um, there aren't any particular incentives because most of CPD funding is um, a formula basis. It's not like you're gonna get receive additional funding for targeting the funds to an opportunity zone. Um, so I would say that no additional sort of benefit, but it is flexible funding that will allow you to, to, I guess it's flexible funding that would probably allow you to attract more opportunities and investment. Thank you. Uh, and we do have another question um, from Tara Beard, uh, who has an idea and wanting to chat with you. Great, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if we talked a little bit about the breaks yet, Orlando, but uh, just the structure of the break. What we've what we've done is try to make um, 15 minute breaks in between the sessions to for everybody to kind of you know take a, a Zoom break and. Um, but we've also kind of made sure that the presenters are sort of going to stick around. And so if you wanted to ask individual questions, um, we can do one on one chats during the break. Uh, so not required for anybody to stick around, please take the time. But if you felt like you wanted to stick around and ask more one on one specific questions, we also have built that time. In there. Uh, I guess one more thing on that, Orlando, would you be able to connect us or Yes, so I'm just chatting uh, to her right now and letting her know that I will be unmuting her. Perfect. Unmuting Tara. Hi, Tara here. I have unmuted you uh, if you wanted to speak with Joey. Oh, I'm sorry, She ha they have no microphone. Okay, um, no problem. I can. I can uh, chat. Okay, great. Are we, uh, are we, we're still on the presentation time though, or are we moving to the break? 
No, we're in the break now. Um, okay. So we are in the break right now. Uh, we will be coming back at 10.45 um, okay. in the next minute. Um, so we are accepting more questions and answers right now, questions right now um, from participants. Uh, but I think we're gonna go ahead and transfer over to present, um, to allow Alicia Hill to present. Um, Alicia Hill is the investment associate uh, from Impact Investment and Private Equity Opportunity Funds from Peer Enterprise Community Partners. Um, and she will be presenting an opportunity fund investor's perspective uh, for 45 minutes with Q&A built into there. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll have a break with Alicia as well. Orlando, would you like me to start sharing my screen and come on? Yeah, on I was video? just gonna. I was just gonna cue you uh, to share Perfect. your screen. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you, Joey. Everyone just bear with me for, for one moment. My Zoom is a little, a little laggy. Okay. Um, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, Orlando, would you like me to hold for just a minute before I get started? Or is it okay if I go ahead and get started? I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alicia Hill. As Orlando mentioned, um, I'm with Enterprise Community Partners. Um, I work under Enterprise's investment arm, specifically on our Opportunity Zones effort. Um, and as an organization, we've been working on Opportunity Zones for quite some time, both with the colleagues that I'm here with today from our advisors team, but also on the capital side, really working with a variety of stakeholders, including investors, looking at projects closely, underwriting projects, and really being steeped in the space for the last few years. And so piggybacking off of the conversation that Joey started um, in the last session, we wanted to provide for you today um, some, just a look at an opportunity zone investor's perspective with a few, a few pieces in mind, uh, keeping that CPD funding concept as a tool to complement or pair with opportunity zone investments and really provide more color on some of the trends that we've seen from investors in terms of the projects they're looking for and where CPD may, um, may be helpful and can sort of connect the dots on those future opportunities so that this tool can really realize its full potential uh, for revitalizing communities. So, you know, I wanted to just um, give us a context and call it a few key, a few key dates uh, that are part of the Opportunity Zones landscape. Uh, thinking back to when the program started back in uh, 2018 and this idea that it was really operationalized in phases and then going through the 2019 and 2020 year, all of the level of effort from many different stakeholders to really provide some clarity around the Opportunity Zones program and really help get investors engaged in the program and also help communities, including stakeholders such as the folks attending today, to really be able to participate in the demonstration of Opportunity Zone projects. Um, the spirit of, of what is the goal in terms of making impactful projects and putting those into communities to really help bring additional resources and attract private capital uh, to the communities to work towards very particular outcomes that are best fit for those communities is something that we in enterprise focus on quite a bit. And it's also a trend that we're seeing among the investor community as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest and appetite to really understand what types of projects can really be catalytic in communities, particularly in the areas of business creation, in the areas of affordable housing, um, and in the areas of, of revitalization generally. And so I think it's important just to spotlight that, you know, as the program was in its infancy, um, really we have a number of, of factors that come into play. Um, obviously, as the pandemic took hold, that had some real implications for trends that we saw in, in the market with respect to investors, with respect to the projects that were moving ahead or perhaps stalled. Um, and then now here we are in the first quarter of 2021 and the, the landscape is evolving. Um, there's uh, Novogratic recently reported as of April that you know, there are over 16 billion in funds that have been raised in qualified opportunity funds. And in general, you know, anecdotally, it's worth noting that 
we are seeing increased investor appetite and seeing a lot of interest among impact investors in particular. We'll talk a little bit more about you know, what the investor landscape looks like and some of the different typologies of investors. But I wanted to highlight that you know, as, as we progress with the program and really continue to, to work together as an industry to um, advance projects that we think are important for communities, um, all different stakeholders, including grantees, including investors, including developers have a role that they can play to really help attract capital to those projects. So in this next slide, you know, I wanted to just highlight a couple of trends that we've seen. Um, oftentimes the question is raised, you know, is the program realizing its full potential? Is it coming to fruition um, in the way that it is intended? And oftentimes, you know, what many stakeholders, including myself, will say is, in some respects, it's a little too early to tell. Um, that being said, there are some trends that we have seen that I think are really important for the group here um, to be aware of, and it might go into your thinking about future ways that, um, that you might be able to support, to support projects or be able to engage around the opportunity zone space. So I would highlight, you know, first and foremost, uh, with so many different zones, um, there's a very diverse universe of communities out there that qualify for opportunity zone investment. But by and large, the idea that capital is being attracted across all of these different areas um, evenly is, is certainly not the case. Um, there are certain trends and certain geographies where there's been more activity to date. And there's also a lot of opportunity for um, communities to work to attract more capital to their area. Um, I would highlight that the growing interest around impact funds um, and impactful projects is something where many different investor types, whether they're institutions or high net worth individual investors are very keenly focused on community investment. They're focused on advancing racial equity. They're focused on affordable housing and providing access to opportunity and capital. And these themes are ones that we're seeing more of. And it really, I think really bodes well for uh, potential opportunities for new communities that aren't seeing as much investments or one, ones that have to really start to go through some of those um, some of those takeaways that Joey highlighted and thinking about what are those assets that can attract interest from the investor community? What are the ways in which CPD funding, as an example, can complement or support projects on the ground that really align with those impact priorities that make sense for the community, but also are really resonating with the investor community as well. We've seen mostly real estate funds to date. Um, I would say more recently within the last 12 months, um, a, very, um, a very clear pivot towards an interest in affordable housing and multifamily projects. Um, you know, part of that, what we're seeing is that as a result of COVID, there's not as much appetite for commercial and retail projects due to concerns around risk that are associated there. But on the flip side, we are seeing that um, you know, the resilience of affordable housing as an investment asset class is something that is very compelling to investors. The spotlight on the need uh, in terms of increasing access to economic development opportunities, to focusing on real estate projects that are catalytic in communities is something that um, is, is starting to take hold in a different way that we weren't seeing initially at the onset of the program, uh, which we think is really encouraging for both communities and both for investors, particularly impact investors. And then lastly, I would call out that um, there, are some, there are a few different trends. There are both national and regional or even local funds. Um, there are some discussions later today where we'll hear some folks who are focusing, have a more regional focus through their fund platforms. But um, I think what's important is that investors have a, have a diverse set of interests. And so in particular, regionally focused efforts, efforts that are really highlighting the attributes of your community oftentimes resonates quite well with investors who are locally focused to that area. That might be by way of a family office. Uh, it might be an individual set of investors, but there are a number of regional and uh, regional opportunity zone funds that have prioritized really trying to attract capital from within their own community um, or within their own region and really spotlighting where there is need and what those key projects and assets are that can deliver upon those goals to their local stakeholders. So um, just following up on this idea of diverse set of investors, um, I wanted to highlight here 
a few different trends among the different types of investors that we've tended to see. This is not an exhaustive list and this is not mutually exclusive, but certainly they tend to fall into two buckets, both the institutional investors and then also what we typically refer to as retail or high net worth. Um, and really the distinction there that we're seeing is, you know, on the institutional side, oftentimes you may see institutions that have a geographic focus that may be by way of their priorities around the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, that is something that is important to note because it provides a, it provides a, a waypoint for projects and communities or local governments that are really focusing on specific opportunity zones to sync up with the investor community or an intermediary if you're working. I know there was a question that was asked around um, you know, using CPD funds in a fund type structure. If you have an intermediary that is playing that fund management role and is really connecting the investors with projects, having a really uh, clear, coherent, local strategy around community impact priorities and projects that are actively happening in the opportunity zones and being able to connect that with those institutional investors that are focused on those priorities is a really important um, connection to be made and one where investors generally take quite a bit of comfort in understanding that a community, whether it be through the layering of CPD funds directly into a project or in a complementary way is supportive of the projects that are happening on the ground and that those align well with um, not only the community's needs, but also from the investor's perspective, the area that they want to support. I would also say that among the institutional, on the institutional side, a lot of focus on affordable housing and multifamily projects, and also quite a bit of focus on very conservative underwriting and capital preservation. Um, and so, you know, I call out conservative underwriting in particular because among a number of the tools that were mentioned in Joey's presentation, you know, particularly with community development and especially with affordable housing, the approach to underwriting those deals has a tendency to be very conservative. And so being able to highlight here are, here are a set of projects that really line up well with the type of criteria and the assessment of risks that matches the investors that we're actively looking for deals for is, is a way to coordinate the execution and coordinate the effort, both from a fund manager's role, from the developer's role on the ground, and then also for other stakeholders, such as grantees that may be participating in the project directly or indirectly, um, that helps bring all those pieces together. So that conservative underwriting aspect really is, an, is a key anchor to the risk assessment that investors are looking at with these projects oftentimes. Um, and then lastly, we've seen a lot of trends around um, social justice. We've seen trends around a community investing in impact. And you'll have institutions, whether they be financial institutions or corporates, that are keenly focused on their own corporate responsibility initiatives and have really started to develop their own impact sensibilities and impact priorities. So this is also an area where highlighting the features of projects and identifying those projects that really deliver benefit to the community, to the low and moderate income population, to the underserved locally, um, which aligns well with the projects that are eligible for CPD funds, that being able to sync up that narrative makes it um, that much better to connect investors with the right types of projects that they may be looking for and attract investment to your local community. On the other side, with the retail and high net worth, um, this tends to be a much more bespoke group. And by that, I would say that, you know, these are impact investors. They may be individuals. They may be a family office. Um, they may be a, an aggregate of a number of individuals or a multifamily office, but in these cases, the impact they're looking for is not just on affordability, it's not just on economic development. It really is much more bespoke. They tend sometimes to have their own criteria around community impact. They may be looking for different types of uh, measurement and assessment, but they also have a tendency to be a little bit more flexible in terms of the requirements that they're looking for. So this is something where I would say it's more on a per project basis, but oftentimes in the regional funds, we see regional funds that have a retail investor base where they're local stakeholders that are in a position to invest in opportunity zone projects are really attracted to those opportunities locally because they understand what's needed in that community. They like that there are stakeholders and partners around the table that are locally focused and they're taking an approach that really takes a concentrated look at driving change in a community through 
direct investment. Um, I would say as well that you're seeing more variety in terms of the asset classes that they're interested in. Um, it may be infrastructure and environmentally focused. It may be commercial and retail projects, but there tends to be a little bit more diversity in terms of the types of opportunity zone investments in communities that they're attracted to and interested in supporting. Um, and then lastly, I would say, you know, something that's important to remember is um, in many respects, and we saw this at Enterprise as well, the interest in opportunity zones um, from the investor community was such that there are new investors around the table that are interested in supporting community development. And each of them may be coming for different reasons. For some on the retail side, it may be part of a portfolio management tax advantage strategy. Um, you know, on the institutional side, it may be heavily anchored in their mission around community development through their own other capital efforts but it's expanded the types of conversations and the level of interest and the number of investors. And so really, you know, keeping in mind that um, with the projects that are in your communities, that there are a diverse set of investors that you have access to do is something I think that's really important to keep in mind. And also keeping an eye out for how changes around, um, you know, various other policies that are related to some of these aspects, whether it be CRA or around um, you know, tax policy and other items will also have impacts potentially for how investors are respond to opportunity zones and, and what their level of appetite is for them. So um, here I wanted to just highlight a couple of things. You know, looking at opportunity zone projects, they're all very different. Um, and oftentimes, you know, these projects are complex. And, you know, that's something that I think many would agree is not uh, foreign to the landscape of community development. Building your capital stack, figuring out how to close gaps is a part of the process to really advance projects that are very much needed. And so I wanted to highlight here some of the barriers to execution that are quite common that we've seen and really just pose for as food for thought ways in which CPD funding could potentially fill a need in the capital stack. And then certainly when we get to the later portion with question and answer and, and for the folks um, you know, within HUD that may have some thoughts on how it's best, best used as well, I would open that up to that when we get to that point. But I wanna highlight number one, um, deal assembly and um, the extended development timeline, that efficiencies that can be identified to help smooth that process are really important for projects. Um, the lack of project readiness and pre-development friction is something where oftentimes that can slow down um, the ability to execute a project or can, can actually make a project infeasible. So that would include things that we've heard earlier, things like um, an entitlement process that is quite lengthy, costly, or otherwise um, is, is uh, challenging to, to be able to advance forward. Uh, being able to make sure that if there are pre-development needs that you need to, to get your project ready to go, whether that's feasibility and market studies to understand what the need is in your community, and do some level of early due diligence so that when it's time for an investor partner to actually closely look at the project, underwrite the project, that a lot of those questions have been answered well in advance and that you have a good understanding of the viability of the project that you're putting forward or any type of programming that may be needed. I think it's also really helpful as a complementary um, solution if we're thinking about ways to complement OZ projects with CPD funds, this idea of feasibility and figuring out if a project is best suited for a particular area is something that, um, that those types of funds can be supportive of in that part of the process, because that's actually earlier stage before an investor gets involved oftentimes. And so that project readiness aspect, that feasibility assessment is part of what helps bring investors to the table and really buy into what is possible in terms of the end outcome that a project can provide. I would also say other trends that we've seen, um, I've described them here as market constraints. And what that means is all markets are different. There are some markets that are slow growers. Um, they're, not, they're not areas where costs are increasing rapidly, but over time, maybe their supply constraints, the supply is quite old. Um, I will give you an example. Recently, we looked at a project where in that particular Opportunity Zone census tract, 90% of the inventory there for housing stock that's affordable to um, people earning 80% of AMI or below was built pre-1930. So these are examples where you have certain market factors, 
whether it's with the supply, the level of demand or growth, where if they are not well aligned with um, what's anticipated for um, future level of demand, you can sometimes have a disconnect that makes it more challenging to bring funds to those projects. Um, and so that's another area where some level of engagement or intermediation or support either directly or in a complementary way from flexible types of funding such as CPD can help enhance the viability of a project so that it can move forward. Um, I would also call out you know, the cost of development. Um, many different places, the needs to actually develop a project are different. Some regions may have reduced access to the labor and trades that are needed to actually construct the project. So it costs more to actually build the project than what might be feasible for um, you know, the actual economics that are associated with that type of project. You could also have a situation where um, access to materials is something that is more challenged in certain regions because of where they are located and where they have to be sourced from. So there are a lot of different inputs that can create um, a challenge to the feasibility of a project. But I think what's important to take away from here is in building out your capital stack, if there are ways to insert flexible funding sources that can take on more risk, so potentially have a role as a type of top loss capital, if, whether that's through a grant or some type of philanthropic source or some type of subordinate debt source that could potentially, you know, at a very low cost of capital, take a bit more risk than perhaps the conventional lender can or that the OZ equity can, that that's a role where a project that may face some of these barriers isn't impeded from moving forward, but just requires a little bit more of knitting together of different resources and some creative structuring to be able to advance that forward. And so I wanted to spotlight here a couple of different areas um, that you know, really are a place to start to think about how CPD funding can play a role and I would lean on Joey's comments that, you know, in, in many of these cases, it may be per project based, based on who the end beneficiary will be from the project. Is it really meeting all the requirements? But I think it's worthwhile for all of the grantees to consider if there's a way for your available CPD funds to help fill out the capital stack so that the sponsor equity need is not as high as it might otherwise be if there's a grant source that can be provided as a form of top loss capital, if there's a subordinate debt source that can be provided from one of the available sources of funding, starting to have those conversations and really think through how can, you know, how can we structure this project and, and build our capital stack to align with a project that's more feasible than it was prior to is a really good place to start to, uh, start to have the conversation and figure out where you can fill in those gaps. So this slide here, I, I wanted to highlight something um, that you know, we're starting to see quite a bit. And the concept is essentially that when you're underwriting for impact and community alignment, uh, you're also offering a risk mitigant um, and really helping to bolster investors' appetites as well as improve community outcomes. And what that means is you know, the success of a project in a particular community um, really does oftentimes depend on how well that project is aligning with the community's needs and is supportive of the evolving landscape in that place. So being thoughtful through community engagement strategies, being thoughtful about how the projects that you're seeing and supporting um, really line up with what's needed in the community and also leveraging the influence that grantee partners have by being able to support projects directly or indirectly um, to really exert that level of influence on those projects and make sure that the ones that are moving ahead really are ones that can offer um, impact that helps to mitigate risk, but really aligns well. So I wanted to highlight a few ways that that, that, that can be realized and things that we've seen. So first and foremost, being able to support projects uh, with nonprofit community partners. Those partners may be as developer, they may be as an operator of a program or service component of a project. Um, they may also be providing some type of rental assistance or guarantee for an income source. But by making funds available to help support mission-aligned partners and mission-aligned projects in some way, that really helps uh, signal to the private investor community um, that these projects are well-supported and benefiting the broader community. And it also provides 
some comfort um, with regard to risk because you understand that you have mission aligned partners around the table to really advance this project forward who deeply understand the market and the needs there. I would also say that providing incentives to help secure the impact that is best suited for your community, that's a priority, is something we see a lot of. Uh, we see lots of projects that are able to move ahead because they have TIFs in place, there are property tax abatements or pilot programs that are in place, there may be subordinate sources, a subordinate debt sources or grants to support the project, and those incentives are paired well because they come with, um, they come with requirements. There are requirements around affordability. Oftentimes those will be very similar to the requirements that you'll see with some of the CPD funding programs. They will have requirements around um, impact assessment and measurement over time and reporting. Um, so there are ways to leverage these incentives and pair them such that they can complement the project, help move it forward, help to balance out the capital sources that are needed, but really help also help secure um, you know, definitively the certain types of impact that are really necessary for um, the project itself to move ahead and for the community's benefit. In addition, I would say um, thinking about resource allocation in terms of technical assistance. Um, a lot of times we do see projects where community partners and sponsors, particularly underrepresented sponsors and developers of color are working on projects in these communities. Um, and if technical assistance is needed to improve the feasibility of the project, to really help provide a level of credit enhancement, to provide um, financial capacity support, or otherwise balance out the capital stack, this is really a way to target areas around um, you know, racial equity and inclusion by thinking about ways to prioritize or look to support projects that are solving for not only impact in terms of the end development itself, but also as a part of who's around the table and who are those development partners that are a part of that effort. Uh, we've seen it as well with different projects where there's a, there's a procurement commitment around some of the different contractors and partners who will actually construct the project and wanting to, to engage uh, minority businesses in those cases. So there's a, there is a way to, to think creatively about supportive resources that may align with um, CPD funding or really a way to start to look through the universe of projects and zero in on which ones have other features that investors will find attractive from an impact perspective, but also meet all of the requirements of the funding solution that are available um, as well. And then I would also call out two other things here um, is, you know, one, really thinking about identifying those assets that are underutilized. This was mentioned earlier. And a lot of times we see efforts around projects that are focusing on increasing connectivity and really revitalizing um, and, and really transitioning projects or sites to their highest and best use for the community's benefit. And these are important because they do line up with um, an impact investors' um, sensibilities as well. A lot of interest on integrating opportunity zone real estate projects in particular with environmental benefit. Um, sometimes that's happening through brownfield redevelopment or vacant blighted sites that have for quite a few years gone, uh, you know, gone untouched that can now be redeveloped. That may be part of actual green building strategies that are put in place. And in some cases, the local governments have their own um, criteria around green building standards that further enhance um, the project and our requirement and can also help to be supported by, by other sources of funding and really wrap around that narrative. And then additionally, transit-oriented development, thinking about programmatic components that can be activated in retail spaces and supported, you know, supporting the operating expenses for services or other programs that can really help um, enliven a community and a place, but thinking about how to increase the engagement and the activation and connectivity on the ground so that the community is more vibrant and holistic overall. So we see that as also another trend of uh, prioritizing projects and identifying those projects where we can meet all of the various requirements that are needed, um, both on behalf of investors and on behalf of the funding solutions that may be at play, but really tell a story around community impact and revitalization and really also speak to the risk point as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, what I have seen in particular is that every, every place is different, every region and every state and market is different. And 
where the opportunity zone activity lives in some places is concentrated in one, you know, one agency uh, concentrated with one particular group or set of folks efforts In other places it's a little bit disjointed. So thinking about how can we champion cross sector coordination, getting the partners around the table and really try to um, align on administrative requirements, trying to connect all of those partners efficiently. There are marketplace platforms. There are sometimes you know, individual coordinators or leaders who are locally based who will also serve as a connector, but really being able to connect those different stakeholders as efficiently as possible is also another way in which thinking about impact and community alignment and risk and how those things fit together, um, those pieces are all part of that story. So I guess I'll do a quick time check, Orlando, because I wanted to talk about and highlight a couple of projects that we've seen, but I just wanted to check in on time, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, we have time right now. Um, so we're on schedule. Uh, I know we were going to wrap up this session at about 11.30, and then we're going to do a break with you uh, where you could take live questions from the audience members. Uh, but we only have two questions right now coming through. Um, Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll pause. Maybe we'll take those couple of questions, and then I'll go through the projects in case yeah, question great. the prior part. Great. Um, so our first question comes from Christina Miranda Palacios. Uh, has there been any cases of OZ projects involving community land banks or community land trusts? That's a great question. Um, so I am I personally have not reviewed any projects involving community uh, land banks. Um, there has been some activity where land banks and uh, community land trusts have worked to identify projects that are in opportunity zones and that may be best fit. So I'm going to punt on the question a little bit, but what I can do is I can do a little bit of, of further diligence to see if there are any uh, examples or if I don't know if any of the, the HUD folks that are on the line are aware of any examples, but it is quite common for um, publicly owned sites or sites that, um, uh, that are part of a land bank as well to be evaluated for, for potential opportunity zone investment as well, but I haven't seen any personally. Thank you, Alicia. Um, next question is from Mary uh, Weinmeyer, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names. Uh, is there a list of available, uh, a list available of funds by region? Uh, so there are some resources. Um, Novogratic has a list of funds um, that's organized. There's also um, some various uh, marketplaces that are a place where projects are matched up with funds as well. So I know later on today, um, we'll have some folks on the panel um, for one of those marketplaces, the Opportunity Exchange. So I will, I'll, I'll maybe wait and let them speak to that directly. But there are some, some fun listings that are available. I would recommend Novogratic as a key resource as well. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, we also have a question uh, that just came in from Lisa McQueen Starling. Um, are there any uh, opportunity zone projects with tribal nations? Uh, I know, also, I can... no, you go, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we actually do have an opportunity zone uh, with Tribal Nations webinar coming up on May 17th, uh, and we could share that link uh, with you to talk about how Tribal Nations are approaching opportunity zones and what projects are being developed. On. And I would just piggyback on that and say um, that at Enterprise, we have reviewed um, a project before that does include a Tribal Nation. Um, and you know we are seeing um, seeing that that's there, and from an impact perspective, um, really think, thinking about other communities that are part of the opportunity zone landscape that we don't touch as often. That includes tribal, that includes rural, but the, the, they are a part of the landscape as well. So um, I definitely encourage you know taking a look at the upcoming webinar, and we certainly are starting to see those projects as well. And there are projects where. The tribal nation may be partnering with a conventional developer as part of the as part of the execution in those cases as well. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, those are all the questions we have. Okay, great. So I'll just highlight a couple of projects, um, and then we can take more questions if there are any. So 
Um, the project that's on your screen now, this is a project um, that's located in the Southeast. It's located in Atlanta, actually. And this project is a project that um, is in an area where um, historically the area had been capital, uh, capitally constrained. Um, there's a need for affordable housing. This project was looking to pair both um, LIHTC funds, so low-income housing tax credit funds, along with opportunity zone funds. And what I want to really highlight here are really some of the features and factors that um, were mentioned earlier. So from a market perspective, this is an example of a market where the fast growing market, um, you know, those underlying fundamentals around master planning, transit oriented development, really having a sponsor partner that understands the local landscape um, is also committed to bringing forward a project that is going to meet a level of demand and need in the local community around affordable housing. And then in addition, really having an investor working alongside who was providing what we oftentimes refer to as but for capital. So an investor committed to working together with the developer, with the fund manager, uh, in this case, it was enterprise and being able to structure and advance a project that otherwise would not have moved forward. The site would have remained um, vacant uh, until the market was, was more attractive for a market execution. And now we have you know, almost 200 units to support um, you know, low and moderate income persons and had committed partners both on the capital side and the development side and on the intermediary side to really advance this forward. And I do think it's important to highlight that in the capital stack, in addition to the LIHTC equity and the OZ equity, the city provided subordinate funds as well. Um, and so this is a, an example of um, you know, a source in which CPD funding, for example, could have been used. In this case, not those types of funds, but something similar where you have a low cost of capital um, subordinate source that can take a bit more risk and help to fill out the capital stack and provide additional comfort um, to the investors as well. So this is another project uh, located in the Southeast. And you know, this is a different market. This is a market that uh, we would call more of a secondary market. Um, it's a market where in terms of the level of need in the community for affordable housing, it, there's more naturally occurring affordable housing but with the incoming, with incoming um, employers, um, high growth employers with increase, increases in rent growth that historically had been quite high over recent years. From a community development perspective, some of the signs that potentially um, afford the affordability problem would start to ramp up in the future is something that, um, that really came to bear here. And so part of what was able to really make this project feasible um, from, from an assessment perspective is number one, the type of product that it was, it was, when I say favorable development cost curve, what that really means is in this particular community, we're talking about a lower cost to build. We're talking about an efficient entitlement, uh, efficient entitlement process. And then you also have all of the market fundamentals that are supporting that. And you have a sponsor that has the financial strength and capacity and knowledge to move the project forward. And in the capital stack, this example is showing a more conventional capital stack with conventional debt, opportunity zone equity, and then also sponsor equity. But I think it's important to highlight that the, in terms of the level of equity need that any project has, that CPD funding sources have the ability to reduce that overall need. And so that's, a, that's something to consider when you're thinking about ways to support projects or how the funds can play a role in, in the projects that are, that are uh, in the market. So this project here, I wanted to highlight for a couple of reasons. So one, um, in this particular project in the Pacific Northwest, this is a high cost city. Um, this is a city where the emphasis on green development strategies, on transit oriented development, on really leveraging the few remaining infill sites to deliver workforce and affordable housing was very important. Um, and part of that narrative um, and that impact story not only resonates with investors, but they were key complementary tools that really help fill out the capital stack to make the project feasible. Um, that includes a property tax exemption that had very specific affordability requirements um, that really made sure that the project could deliver benefit to that particular community. 
It also had a nonprofit um, sponsor uh, and community partner that was really at the helm of the project, exerting their own influence and knowledge of what was needed in the market and making sure there was alignment with community priorities. And then in addition to that, you know, the capital stack, again, is one where there potentially could be opportunities for something similar in another market to be able to use CPD funding in that capital stack and have the ability to speak to all the different other impact criteria that's important to the community and also important to investors as well. And then lastly, I would highlight, um, you know, within the Northeast, this is another market where I would describe it as a tertiary market. It's a naturally um, occurring affordable housing market. It's definitely a slow grower. It's a market that as a result of the recession in 2008, um, took quite some time to start to accelerate and progress. And collectively, the development authority there has made significant investment over time in really revitalizing the community, really eliminating zombie properties that were in the immediate central business district, and really focusing on delivering um, you know, a more vibrant community in the area. And one of the greatest challenges there is that the supply that's available is very limited and quite old. So from a livability perspective, individuals who are earning 80% um, of AMI or below don't have a ton of options that really support a better quality of life. And so being able to deliver affordable housing that meets that goal um, it was really the, the it was really the spirit behind why this project um, is moving ahead. Um, but there are some key components that are helping it helping the the numbers work in this case. So that includes a pilot um, and sales and use tax exemption for development here, having the support of the local government partner, both in terms of providing those incentives, but also um, the willingness to advance and prioritize this project over others and making the process from a pre-development perspective. Um, as seamless as possible. Um, and then in addition to that, you have the capital stack where it's a growing developer. Um, they are benefiting not only from some of the incentives that are reducing the equity need to the project, but also are committed to the community and have that local understanding. And it's another area where thinking about flexible funding sources that can help build the capital stack so that it isn't only reliant on conventional mechanisms can help move projects like this. So Orlando, I'll pause there um, to see if there are any other questions um, that folks have. No, we don't have any more questions right now. Um, so if you wanted to keep going. Okay. So I think, um, you know, this, this takes me through most of what I had to present today. And so I don't know if it makes sense for us to pivot to a break, but I just want to reiterate a couple of points. Um, you know, the investor community, um, all investors don't want the same things. And, um, you know, as, as someone that's within an enterprise that really has an intermediary role, we're having the opportunity to engage with a diverse group of investors, but also really intimately understand projects and really work closely with community partners and stakeholders who are also looking at these projects as well. And so I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough how important being able to align both the community benefit aspect along with the funding need. It's really, it's not just part of the story, but it really is what oftentimes will bring investors to the table. They wanna understand that they're able to demonstrate what Opportunity Zones is intended to do in communities through these, through these investments. And they're really looking to um, community partners, including grantees among, to really help signal where the attention should be focused. So there really is an opportunity, whether it's in partnership on a project, whether it's working with an intermediary who may be involved in projects to exert that level of influence and really help to call attention and attract um, investor interest to those particular places. And you know, also help to identify where the need is. If it's technical assistance that can help improve the feasibility of a project, um, there, is, there are partners that are interested and able to support that effort. Or if there's a solution, a funding solution like CPD that can help provide that, that source to support that need, then the other pieces of the project can be knitted together. So that's something that I wanna, I think is worth repeating because it is something where putting these projects together is, can, can be 
um, can be challenging because it requires a number of different pieces, um, but at the same time, really starting to align around the economics of projects, the impact, and thinking about what types of tools can actually help bring everything together is a lot of what the process is. So being able to sort of match make, um, you know, through the tools that you have in your toolkit and working with the partners, whether it's working with partners directly at HUD to figure out what the right use is, whether it's working with a nonprofit or intermediary partner such as Enterprise or other partners that are in the space and we'll hear from others today. Um, that really is where, you know, kind of how the sausage gets made, if that makes sense. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so we are at the point right now where we're able to take some more live Five questions uh, from our attendees. And I'm just gonna share my screen really quick to show and to remind attendees how that may work. Um, so you may use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during the session. Uh, and we will uh, address, we will we'll try to bring up uh, these questions as, as possible. Um, during the roundtable discussion panel, uh, you can have the ability, you do have the ability to raise your hand and to ask live questions directly to the panels uh, or to the facilitator. Uh, please raise your hand. We do encourage you to raise your hand and to ask live questions. Um, we're happy to take all the questions. Uh, the moderator will unmute you and call on you to ask your question. Uh, if you do not want to ask your question live, you can just go through the Q&A panel uh, and ask your question through there. When people are asking questions through the uh, uh, live, we are encouraging participants to turn on their camera when asking the panelists questions. Uh, since this is a roundtable discussion, I think we would all be in live. Uh, we would all see each other otherwise. Thanks, Orlando and Alicia. And I'm wondering if folks had ideas um, just generally after hearing some of the information that Alicia presented on and that I presented on, if if people wanted to, to discuss any ideas that they were thinking of in terms of um, projects or just general ideas that they were considering um, as you start to think about your specific opportunity zone. Also happy to provide any clarity on any of the presentations you've heard so far. So if you had just general questions out there about any of the information that, um, that you heard so far, feel free to ask any questions there as well. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Alicia. So we'll start with the next session at, um, at 11.40 uh, with opportunities and approaches to complement OZ investments. Uh, this will be a session of 75 minutes and will take us to 12.55. Uh, Alicia will be facilitating the conversation with our guest panelists. Um, James Caras from Caras Community Investment, Peter Troj from the Opportunity Exchange, Mark Elliott from South Carolina Opportunity Fund, and Lamont Price from TN Investco, our Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. Uh, we will start promptly at 11.40 a.m. East Coast time. Uh, if we don't have any questions now, then we can take a break. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. It is 11.40, and we'll go ahead and get started uh, with our next session, Opportunities and Approaches to Complement OZ Investments. And this is a great roundtable discussion uh, being led by Alicia. Uh, I'll go ahead and let Alicia take it away. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thanks, Orlando. Um, so we're now going to be joined by a group of esteemed panelists to really talk about um, opportunities and approaches to complement OZ investments. Um, I know Orlando listed the folks that'll be joining us today, but, but just to introduce them formally, um, we do have today, we have, um, pardon me, okay. So we've got Jim, Jim Karras is joining us today. Uh, we also have Lamont Price, Mark Elliott, and Peter Truog. So I'll let them introduce themselves individually, but I wanted to get us started by asking each of them a question based on their experience. Um, the folks today on the panel are really coming to this from different, um, different vantage points in the OZ landscape. So just to get us started here, um, I think I'm gonna start with um, Peter. And Peter, I wanted to ask you, you know, you helped co-found the, the um, Opportunity Exchange and have been an early innovator in the OZ space. And so wanted to hear more about how community partners are really leveraging the platform to attract investment to their communities um, and how you see the impact investing narrative really um, taking hold as part of that stakeholder participation, participation and interest on the platform. And if you could tell us a little bit about the platform as well. Yeah, sure. Happy to get things kicked off. Thanks, Alicia. Um, thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. Excited to spend the next hour or so with, with folks uh, engaging in this conversation. So my name is Peter. I'm a co-founder of the company called uh, the Opportunity Exchange. We build software that helps community leaders plan, finance, and build uh, real estate and business across their community. We work with 15 or so cities, counties, regions, and states across the country. And so my remarks today will be based upon the um, experience of, of supporting those different communities and, and working with them as they've uh, gone through many of the, you know, various steps of the process that have been discussed so far today uh, as they put together their opportunity zone strategy. Um, I'll say specifically to uh, a lot of the things that I think will come up in this discussion, at least from my perspective, will reinforce a lot of what um, I heard Alicia talking about moments ago in terms of strategies that communities can use to um, mobilize support um, around community aligned and impactful projects in their community. Um, and there's a couple of ways specifically that the Opportunity Exchange helps out with, with those processes. Um, and that I think in general, we see communities adopting as they think about strategies to advance these types of economic development and community development goals in their community. Um, I think one of the things that we see as especially important, and I'm sure will come up in, in various remarks this afternoon is um, thinking about building and developing narrative for your community as it comes to case making for why folks um, should be interested in it, um, what types of assets uh, you know your community has that can be built around, you know previous investments or, or, or momentum that would cause folks from across the country um, who are interested in leveraging the opportunity zone incentive to you know pay attention to your community as opposed to any of the others that are out there. I think this is a really critical first step and involves um, thinking about developing that community narrative. I know Alicia spoke a bit about building sort of um, cross-sector coordination uh, within your community and it often involves uh, kind of building that coalition and developing that common narrative across, across all the different stakeholders involved. This is one of the most common kind of starting points that we typically see um, communities embarking upon as they kind of begin their journey into the OZ space. Um, and some, something that we have, uh, that we help out with. Um, and so I figure uh, in terms of your question, Lisha, kind of ways that we help out, this is one of the, one of the things that we see most commonly that happy to speak about more as, as we get into the conversation. Second of, of, three, of three things is um, around project structuring. I think this is something that came up and happy to talk more about is strategies for assisting developers or business owners as they think about mean ways to pursue opportunities on capital. And then third is thinking about connections. Um, whether it's opportunity zone investors or other sources of capital that can be helpful for particular deals. Um, this is a, a common question that we receive from folks we work with, folks we don't, people who are just curious about the spaces. What are the best ways to get connected? Um, and this is kind of a third area that, that we can spend some time talking about this afternoon. 
So really excited to be here. I'm happy to jump into all this in more detail as we go, but uh, I'll turn it back to you, Alicia, um, to continue with the introduction. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and I think you highlighted something really wonderful, which is that there are many different ways in which your platform is adding value to the different stakeholders because there's a diverse set of needs. And so something that we wanted to do as part of the conversation, and I'll turn it to Orlando for this, is really to put up uh, a couple polling questions to better understand where the attendees are, are coming from as part of this conversation. So Orlando, I'll, put it, I'll turn it over to you to put up our first polling question. Thank you, Alicia. So we have uh, a couple of questions that I'll be uh, putting up now. And I'm launching it now. Uh, have you ever developed on an opportunity zone? Have you ever leveraged CPD funding? And have you ever leveraged CPD funding on an opportunity zone? And we'll go ahead and give it a few minutes. We have quite a few people voting in. Thank you. We appreciate this. Give it 10 more seconds. We still have a few people floating. And we're closing the poll now. So I'll share my results. 90% uh, of those polled, uh, 53 individuals have developed on an opportunity zone. Uh, 45 or 76 percent have leveraged CPD funding, uh, and the vast majority, uh, 95 percent, have leveraged CPD funding on an opportunity zone. We have three people here that have uh, leveraged CPD funding on an opportunity zone. Uh, again, 95 percent have not. Thanks for, for sharing those results, Orlando. I think that um... Uh, based on the responses, that's a great segue to introduce Jim and, and really get some feedback on um, examples of CPD funding being paired with opportunity zones from someone who's really been steep in the space and lending his, his extensive experience and expertise uh, to community development and community investing initiatives. So Jim, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and then also if you can tell us about um, an example of an OZ project where you've seen CPD funds paired alongside of that, and, and certainly any feedback you have on some common uh, gaps where you find that CPD funding solutions are helpful or where they're just in general are gaps that we're seeing stakeholders solve for on these projects. And thank you, Alicia. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel, and it's good to be with the group of folks that are attending today. Um, just as a preface to some of my comments uh, about specific projects that have received CPD funding uh, is that, you know, we often look at the local, uh, if you will, uh, systems and ecosystems in, in communities in terms of how do we deal with development finance. There's a large number of people that are attending this session today, and I could imagine that the uh, uh, level of experience in terms of development finance varies from some great expertise. This may possibly smaller or mid-sized communities where you, you, the, your job is to focus on uh, grant management and grant activities and not necessarily putting together uh, transactions such as this. So I, I just open up with a, a kind of an underlying question in, in response is, you know, thinking through how are you organizing your community relative to putting together these complicated stacks? Alicia well pointed out earlier in terms of the role of enterprise and other intermediaries. Certainly, Peter, through the Opportunity Exchange, uh, to a degree, provides that as well. But there are hundreds of communities around the country that lack intermediaries or some expertise in terms of being able to put the capital stack together. So it begs the question of 
the to me for for CPD or uh, 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 entitlement communities is to think through what kind of ecosystem do we have. If a developer has a project, whether it's a nonprofit or a, a CDC or a community land bank or a community land trust mission driven organization has a project, where do they go to find these gaps and help structure the deal? And I think that question is not necessarily one if you, there are some folks out there that can want to share their experiences, the positive experiences. But I my 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 thesis is is that many of the attendees probably don't have that system in place and it becomes very fractured in terms of trying to take not just CPD funding, but new market tax credits, historic tax credits, uh, energy tax credits, uh, low income housing tax credits, and a myriad of other alphabet soup programs from uh, state governments and, and, and federal incentives. Um, having said that, it, it is Somewhat, if you use the old metaphor, it's the wild west out there in terms of trying to put this capital stack together. And, and we're asking investors and developers, you figure it out. You've got Opportunity Zone Fund uh, available. You know what your equity is, what you might be able to leverage for private debt. But I still have a gap. Now, where do I go to get that information? We. And, and, and getting to the specific question about where CPD funding has been utilized, uh, to be very frank, it, it mirrors the poll results. There are very few examples of CPD funding. And, and I had, don't mean to walk into the party uh, hosted by uh, HUD uh, and is not pointing fingers at all, but it's the reality of the situation. There aren't many examples of CPD funding. Uh, for instance, opportunity zone development activities have been primarily real estate driven, and they've been primarily new projects. So right off the bat, CDBG cannot necessarily be used directly in new construction. Uh, now, home funds could be used, uh, but uh, CDBG and 108 uh, for new construction is not going to be able to be uh, utilized. So that that takes out a, a huge chunk of, uh, of the market where you may want to be able to participate. Um, so where you may want to participate is, is maybe not so much in the deal, and I'll talk about one deal very uh, shortly, but you may want to look at what are the supportive ac activities we can use CWG uh, to uh, help some of these projects. So for instance, if it's a mixed use project where it's residential and commercial and retail, are there things that you could be doing with some of the small businesses that are located in the retail or commercial space utilizing CDBG to do so? Um, are there infrastructure uh, improvements that can take place? Or even prior to all these hard costs as the, some of the soft costs of thinking about neighborhood planning and community planning, is there a community plan uh, beyond, beyond your consolidated plan, but is there a community place plan um, or a community plan in place that you can uh, help fund some of the activities uh, or implement some of the recommendations of that community driven plan? Uh, one project in particular that we saw in uh, Newark is called Teachers Village. Uh, it is a very large multi use, uh, mixed use, if you will. Um, plus affordable housing project. And we did see some CPD funding go into that, but it was a relatively small amount given to the size of, of, of the project, was, which was over $150 million. And I'm, I'll be glad to add to this uh, in, in a bit. Sorry if I ran over, but I thought it was important to get some of the context in uh, relative to trying to find those deals with CPD funding. I think that's a really important point. And, you know, you really highlighted something that, um, you know, is, is, a, is a question that I myself have asked, which is how can we start to see more examples? And so really thinking about what exists in the, in your local ecosystem, I think is a wonderful point. And I just wanna um, just pull up a slide just to kind of put in the backdrop here um, for us where, you know, you, you touched on something really interesting, which is what are other ways that CPD funding could go to um, complement or support other aspects of those communities. And so 
you know, again, this is not necessarily an exhaustive exclusive list, but just highlighting some of the key types of CPD funds and some of those impact areas and place-based strategies where they touch up upon being able to deliver that kind of community benefit in many of the different ways that you mentioned, um, Jim, I think is really important. Um, and so, so I appreciate all of your comments. And so I'm gonna pivot. Uh, first, I'll check in with Orlando to see if we have another poll question that we wanna throw up before we move on to, uh, to Mark and Lamont. Uh, Alicia, if I could jump in very quickly. Yeah, please. That chart, that chart is perfect. And, and, and I would encourage everybody, I know you can download slides later, but take a screenshot of that chart and put it right on your desk because that, that really answers kind of the bottom line question, I think, in terms of what can I do from a CPD perspective. Thank you for posting that. Yeah, absolutely. Orlando, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jumped in on you, go ahead. No, we don't have any more polling questions. Uh, okay. we, uh, has had a lot of polls come through already. We do have one question coming through, uh, but I'll go ahead and let you continue. Sure, okay, great. Um, so I wanna pivot here and I'll pivot to Mark. Um, Mark is, um, it has the unique position of being on the panel and really can offer um, from a, a regional opportunity zone fund perspective. So I'll let him speak to that, but in particular, it would be great to, to hear how you think about um, opportunity zone investments from both a rural and a um, uh, urban perspective based on what you're seeing in your, in your role at the South Carolina Opportunity Fund and, and really give us a sense of you know, who your stakeholder community is. Perfect. Well, thank you, Alicia, I appreciate it. My name is Mark Elliott. I run the South Carolina Opportunity Fund. Uh, we're an opportunity fund just, just focused on the state of South Carolina. Um, so, we, uh, our goal is to try and invest in all 46 counties uh, in the state. And, and in doing that, uh, we have to get kind of creative. Every, every county and every city in, in the state um, doesn't necessarily have, uh, have a great economy. So we try and focus on triple bottom line projects, which are uh, financial, social, and environmental. We think that makes sense given the long-term holding period of an opportunity zone fund. Um, environmental, in my mind, means, hey, we're going to build these buildings to a higher standard with better materials so they'll be uh, able to last longer and you'll have lower costs of ownership. Um, and then in terms of uh, social tying to building some way into a community, buildings change. I mean, it, you could probably look around your own city, you could say this building was built for this one function and five years later, it's doing something else, right? So we have buildings that change. So thinking long-term about, all right, how do we tie this building into a community so that it will still be being used 10 years from now is really important or building it in a way that can maybe can be a little more versatile and change its use uh, further down the line and, and maybe making it so that it's um, future-proof to some extent. Um, and, and some of the uh, uh, design and, and um, infrastructure elements. So, um, yes. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we have a couple of people saying that they're having difficulty hearing you uh, with their okay. audio. Should I switch to the computer? I'm on my phone. Uh, maybe that might help. All right, so I'll mute my phone. All right, let's try that. Is that better? We can hear on our end. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, that helps with some of the participants are, are can you hear me? able to listen now. Yeah. I'm going to hop out and hop back in. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. Sorry about that. So I think it looks like Mark's going to re log back in. So Let's pivot. Um, so I want to turn to Lamont Price. Um, and Lamont Price is, is a leader in the OZ space and in his Tennessee region and community. And I'll let him speak to that. But um, the one thing that I would want him to comment on, Lamont, if you don't mind, is, is really talking to us about how you think about connecting the various stakeholders from your position um, and really tell us more about you know, what community stakeholders can be thinking about in terms of coordinating the developers, coordinating um, the different funds, the different partners, and, and also thinking about how grantees fit into that story. I know Jim highlighted sometimes understanding where to go to get those resources is as much a part of the, of the process and the calculus behind figuring out how to put these deals together. And to what extent are you seeing that every day? If you could share with us um, some feedback there. Uh, thank you all for having me, HUD, as well as Enterprise. Lamont Price with Tennessee State Government. And just quickly, can you guys hear me? 
just for good measure. All right, good. Yeah, so uh, from a statewide perspective, you know, we're, uh, we're, I guess we're a little bit different than uh, some other states. You know, one of the things we've been tasked with is just really uh, the education and information component of the OZ incentive. So uh, the first step is just getting folks to understand what the incentive is, because again, it's tax law. So what we try to do is really frame it from the perspective of it's a place-based initiative. If you can, if you can, a lot of community development folks probably are on this uh, webinar, uh, think of it as a place-based initiative. And these folks are savvy, they're veterans at growing uh, their community from within. So looking at the OZ incentive as a place-based initiative, uh, I think can help frame it. And, and what we're seeing is, you know, when we do our regional sessions, one of the things we, we've been trying to do as much as possible is to tie in the federal partners. Uh, and we have, uh, our, our state is broken up into nine different regions on the development district model. And we held regional sessions uh, the last couple of years in each region. And what we tried to do is to bring on board federal partners like HUD uh, participated uh, in one of our sessions, uh, EDA as well. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, well, there were, you know, there were other partners who could add to that capital stack through, you know, or help to subsidize a project through grant funding. And so part of it is, is just getting folks to understand this is how it can help your community. But um, in addition to that, we also brought along, you know, a tax attorney to help uh, talk about what the capital stack is and how, you know, and how to develop it, you know, and I think Jim mentioned uh, and I think uh, even Joy mentioned uh, historic tax credits, like how, how to layer in those incentives that a lot of these communities are already using, pilots, TIFs, where do they fit in in the OZ incentive and development process? And so really just helping communities to, to really understand if you, if you think of it uh, uh, as a, as a place-based initiative uh, or you can even think of it in, in terms of when you're trying to recruit or even retain a, a manufacturer or a business in your community. It's a lot of the same principles because one, you're doing research to show this company, this is why you should come or stay. Here are the regional assets and here's how we can partner, whether it be through, through grants or through help with infrastructure to help you to grow or expand your business. So there are a lot of similarities from an economic development perspective, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Lamont, um, for sharing that. And before we pivot back to Mark, um, something that you know really stuck out to me by your comments is this idea of leveraging the position of um, being a convener to really get folks around the table, not only to highlight um, the initiative, to highlight the tool, but also to bring in, even if it's at a high level initially, some form of technical assistance to help to insert that understanding. And so I think that that's something um, that's worth spotlighting here because we certainly have heard that different communities have different resources, have a different, different sorts of ecosystems. And so that's something that really stuck out and, and a place where I know in this conversation, we'll talk about more um, how technical assistance and other types of um, roles that, the, that these types of funding sources or partners who are sitting at the table to really think about how to allocate these resources can be a part of those conversations. Mark, I would pivot it back to you um, for you to, to finish your comments and, and really tell us more about, you know, from the regional fund perspective, um, how, are you, how are you seeing these projects demonstrated on the ground in your area? And in particular, from a funding need, if you're not seeing CPD funds in these projects, is there a flexible capital need in the projects that you're seeing? Um, it, through your work at the at the South Carolina Opportunity Fund. Sure. Can, can everybody hear me? I can hear All you. All right. Woohoo. We're good. Okay. Success. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly summarize my intro. So, Mark Elliott, South Carolina Opportunity Fund, focused on triple bottom line pro projects, uh, which is financial, social, environmental. Um, we're focused on all 46 counties, which forces us to get creative about some of the deals that we do. Um, so in thinking about OZ from a uh, OZ investments um, from a rural and urban standpoint, um, from an urban standpoint, you know, I think we have to be careful about what projects we're putting in um, different areas. I don't ever want to be part of a project where we are um, 
kicking out the people that have lived there for a long time. That's not exciting for me. So we try and do um, projects where, you know, maybe we are, maybe, you know, maybe we're knocking out a couple small houses, uh, but then we're putting up a multifamily so we can increase the density of that land. We would then go back to the individuals that were there and maybe offer them a reduced rent um, or, or something of that nature, something that keeps them in the community, or we've even offered to some of their family members, hey, you know, you, you want to move on from this, you decide you want to retire and go to Florida, but what about your kids? Maybe one of your kids want to stay in the house that they grew up in, you know, in that neighborhood. Um, so we also look at trying to tie in, um, for example, at, uh, at a retail level or even the local level. So sometimes you have a mixed use development. Maybe you've got someone in the neighborhood that wants to start up a, a bar or a coffee shop. Um, where you bring in those local folks and you use an OZ investment, right? Because you can do an opportunity zone investment from a business standpoint. So you say, hey, I'm going to give you $50,000, $100,000. You're going to use this to fix up the space, but we're going to own a small percentage of your business and um, you're going to run it. So it reduces their risk, reduces your risk. You get to program exactly all the different companies and, and um, uh, amenities you want to see built into your community and you're tying in people and raising folks up. So I love that model. I think it's... Um, really interesting. Um, some of the projects that we've been forced to, uh, not forced, but we've explored and, and actually come up with um, some creative solutions, especially in some of the rural areas, um, is uh, really come across kind of this municipal model. So where we can take pretty much any asset a municipality needs, put it in an OZ fund, and then we basically lease it back to them. And, you know, maybe year 10, we sell it to them for a dollar. So we're currently working on two city halls. Uh, for cities. So we're going to basically build them in new city halls, revitalizing um, old buildings. Um, and they get all the amenities and things, they get to consolidate things, they get to offer their um, uh, 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 residents some really unique features. So one of them uh, is actually an old bank building, so it actually has six teller lanes, so they can now do COVID-free payments for all the utilities that they own. So uh, we're coming with some creative solutions. And what's nice about that, too, is we're seeing a lot of areas where um, you are not seeing buildings sell for at least their replacement value. So if I went and I tore this building down and I wanted to rebuild it, what would the cost be? And, you know, let's say, you know, 5,000 square foot downtown, let's say, I don't know, $500,000. We're going to places where you can buy those buildings and, you know, maybe it's $30,000. So super depressed values. So we're trying to engineer appreciation for some of these communities by, you know, doing a city hall, doing other projects and pushing those comp levels up. And when you do that, you raise everyone in the community up. And then what we're also starting to do is try and buy buildings um, throughout the downtowns to help kind of bring them back up as well. Maybe we're bringing universities to do a project on one or community center or getting um, uh, maybe some government funding or grants to do some other things. So, so when you can kind of dogpile these investments in different areas, you can really start to show uh, some success and progress. And, and like I said, kind of engineer that appreciation because it's it's something that can be changed. It's because a building is, is worth a small amount of money now doesn't mean it's not going to be worth more in the future. So to answer your question about flexible capital, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of need for flexible capital and, and projects like that. I mean, you could do so many interesting things um, and you never know who the stakeholders are going to be and who might be interested in, in kind of joining the, 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 the party to, to, to help a community. So um, I'll stop there. That's, that's kind of um, in a nutshell, though. Thank you for that. And you said a lot of really wonderful things there. And I like that phrase, um, engineering appreciation. And you know what, what I think is important to highlight in your comments is you really are talking about a strategy of concentrating the focus of the investments in a very specific locale or number of locales and really anchoring around what is really needed in that place. Um, and so I want to, again, just put, to put up on the backdrop um, another slide that I think really does also um, speak to part of what you're highlighting, which is number one, these communities are diverse. There's not a one size fits all um, capital solution or implementation strategy that can work in every place. It really inv involves a level of customization. Um, the idea that complementary sources are really needed. And then also thinking about in terms of flexible capital, what are some direct or indirect ways in which it can be supportive of these projects and businesses? And you highlighted some great examples um, for us. And so, you know, I want folks just to have in the backdrop here, this idea of the various uses that all the folks on the panel and that I as well have seen in projects where we're solving for some aspect of that project that needs to be advanced forward. 
Maybe it is, you know, what Mark spoke about with respect to a business that's looking to be stood up that needs some capital, some working capital to rehabilitate a space and coming up with a creative mechanism to keep that business owner in the position to operate the business and really reduce risk for the investor. But overall, it enhances the community. Maybe it's thinking about this municipal model that was highlighted. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, ask everyone on the panel and anybody can, can jump in first is, each of you is, is giving us a sense of in your particular role with the partners you're working with, there's a type of impact that the community needs and there's a way to talk about it and a way to connect and frame that narrative. And so um, it'd be great to hear to what extent um, there are effective ways that um, you know, local stakeholders, uh, whether they be folks in the grantee positions or actual uh, elected officials actually discuss the impact impact that's possible in their community to attract investment? How do you tell that story effectively um, in your individual communities? What have you seen that's been effective and resonated with investors, local or otherwise? Uh, and maybe I'll start with, with Peter, just given that um, you really have highlighted this role of connecting. Uh, what have you seen that's been effective? Yeah, I'll mention um, two, two particular strategies that we've seen work, um, and I'll preface by Relay, and I was on a conversation last week um, on a similar topic related to community strategies to uh, approaching opportunities and investment. And one of the comments that struck me was there was an, uh, an investment fund on the conversation, and they really highlighted the importance of this question that you just posed, Alicia, for places that can approach us with a um, coordinated narrative about what makes their community a great place to consider for investment. What is what work they've done so far to validate some of the ideas that they're coming forward with and the information they've already assembled to help us accelerate some of this information gathering process. Places that can accomplish those goals effectively, uh, we are much more excited to have further conversations with and continue to do business with. And so I think in those comments, and I'm curious to Mark here, your perspective about some of these dialogues I'm sure you've had, um, really raises to, to me the importance of, of, this, of this question of how do you present a compelling narrative for your community and how do you then tell specific uh, stories for particular projects that you want to see happen within that larger narrative. I'll mention two tools for each that are helpful to consider. On the community narrative piece, um, I'd encourage folks uh, who haven't already to look at some of the opportunity zone investment prospectuses that have been built across the country. We see these happening, uh, being built at a neighborhood level, a city level, uh, a regional level. Um, if you Google, you know, Opportunity Zone Prospectus, uh, Accelerator for America is an organization that has provided a lot of uh, guidance for putting these together. Lamont, I know you've worked on some of these in Tennessee. Um, this is a great model to consider. Um, we, we also support some of this work via the tools we've built on Opportunity Exchange. They're all great resources and models to think about as you do some of that community level storytelling. Um, the second part of it is within that broader narrative, you obviously need to have things to invest in and build around. And so you need to tell the story for particular projects too. Um, I think that this is sometimes an area where, you know, uh, communities uh, maybe haven't been as proactive as, as they've been around some of that broader community storytelling. Um, and I think that thinking about mechanisms and profiles to kind of showcase, not only do we have a compelling overall story, but there are some really exciting particular things that we want you to focus on now is a, is a critical kind of second half to this equation. Um, again, I think this is something that if you uh, look at our website, theopportunityexchange.com, you'll see some of the ways that different communities that we work with are presenting particular narratives for deals that they wanna see happen. But this is something that a lot of places have considered too, not just us, at Erie, Pennsylvania is an example that comes to mind. They've built a website for their city that showcases particular project ideas that they're prioritizing at the moment. And so there, you know, whether it's, um, no matter kind of where you look, you can find examples of this that are compelling. And I'd encourage you to think about, uh, another one that comes to mind is RFPs as another way to think about like, what do you include in an RFP? When have you had really successful engagement with developers around kind of proposing particular project ideas? Think about those experiences as maybe an analog for a lot of the information that you'll want to pull together to, to make a compelling pitch for some projects in this space as well. So on both points, uh, just try to offer some, some resources for ideas for both telling that community level overarching narrative, as well as then particular stories for deals within it. Thank you, Peter. I saw you know, on the panel certainly some head nodding, including my own, around a lot of the tools that, that you highlighted there. 
And um, and I know um, you mentioned Mark and, and Mark, you know, it would be, it'd be great to hear if what Peter shared is what you're seeing as well around investors really being responsive to this uh, coordinated narrative that really is clear and helps spotlight where there's opportunity to support certain projects and what how that fits into the fabric of the community. Does that align with what you're seeing as well? Yeah, you know, I, I think Peter makes a really good point that, you know, there's sometimes where I go and I'll reach out to a community and I'll say, hey, you know, I'm interested in your community, so you have an opportunity zone track. What's your plan? What do you guys want to do with it? And, um, you know, sometimes I'll get the response back and they'll say, oh, you know, you should talk to Rob. He's uh, he's our local realtor. He'll tell you all the property that's for sale. That's not what I want to hear when I'm calling these communities. I want to hear that you guys have a plan, that there's something in place, that uh, there's a project or projects that you're really excited about. So um, it's nice when someone's thought that through because I don't have to put the, the thought into thinking about what your community needs. If you guys, if, if the community has, has you know, had that conversation, talk to some folks, I've even seen where projects are entitled and they're just ready to go. And they said, hey, look, we entitled the project, we de-risked it. There's a great project in um, North Augusta, South Carolina, um, where, I mean, they, you know, this may not meet the triple bottom line threshold, but they got, you know, they moved in um, a minor league baseball team. They did some apartments, they did some other stuff, but it was all entitled in an OZ. Um, and they basically, you know, T took out the time piece so you didn't have to worry about that. They took out the um, the risk of not being able to get the project done because it was it was ready to go. Um, so yeah, and, and in South Carolina, we're kind of lucky. Our our, uh, our state has put out grants for opportunity zone prospectuses. So I think you can have up to fifty thousand dollars towards um, a prospectus for a city or county. So I mean, everyone should take advantage of that because it's um, something that's going to help you. And I think those conversations are definitely needed. Um, and I think. Um, you know, some of the things that I've seen too that are helping are the, um, the councils of government. So especially those cities that don't have a lot of resources. Sometimes I run into where, you know, you, you have one person who's trying to basically run the whole county essentially or the whole city. Uh, they don't have a lot of resources and now they've been tasked with opportunity zones, which they don't know much about. And they're trying to figure it out. Um, so the COGS are really good um, resource. They can actually help with grant writing and, and that type of stuff. So I, I, I think they're a phenomenal resource. Um, I've actually worked with a couple of nonprofits too. Um, one that I, I love, um, is Development Finance Initiative out of um, uh, UNC. So it's a nonprofit. And um, I mean, they'll go in, they'll partner with the city and they might take a small fee, you know, maybe it's like $50,000 to get started. But they will go, they'll do um, an entire community assessment. They'll talk to neighbors, um, they'll do market studies, they'll do uh, zoning, site work, everything. And basically what, what they do is they get it uh, figured out, they figure out how the community's tied into the project they'll put it out for an RFP and then they'll make a small um, bit of the developer fee. So once they put it out, that's how they make their money, but, but it's a nonprofit. So, so their whole goal is to try and invoke kind of community development. So um, I kind of, if I see a good community that I think would um, benefit from that type of, you know, hey, help us figure out what type of projects could get up and running. I, I always point into the DFI. I, th I think they're a great resource and they're, they're good folks. Um, and, and we've certainly worked on a few projects with them. So yeah, there's definitely resources out there for people, but to Peter's point, having a plan and, and knowing what you're gonna show investors helps. Because if you don't have anything, I mean, look, there's lots of other places that have it. It's a competition at the end of the day for investors dollars and you have to put your best foot forward. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. And I, um, I wanna turn to Jim because your comments, Mark, really, you know, I think highlighted what Jim mentioned before, which is that in some communities, the like what resources are available are not necessarily um, you know abundant where there's an entire office or group dedicated to solving for this. So Jim, I wanted to just hear from you. You know, based on Mark's feedback, um, what would you encourage, or where have you seen it successful? Where a community that's constrained in terms of you know how much attention can be put to figuring out, you know, what is the best use of these assets for the partners that have been effective in helping to provide some of that support? Uh, thank you for the question. And, and I, I certainly want to echo and uh, support both uh, Peter and Mark in terms of their comments. Uh, specifically, the notion of a prospectus uh, has become a very uh, common tool that helps uh, create a scenario of this is what we want. The question then is, 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 who's the we? Who put the prospectus together and how much does it represent uh, the community itself? 
Therefore, the prospectus, in my mind, should be driven by what Mark was talking about as well, is a plan that is uh, is done in conjunction with the community. And, and there are numerous examples of that. Here in Florida, I'm based in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we have redevelopment areas or redevelopment agencies. There are about 175 of them. They are tax increment financing agencies. So a lot of the community planning, if you will, because these TIF districts by law must have a community plan, have already gone through the planning process. And many of these community redevelopment districts are also have designated opportunity zone, uh, uh, are, are designated as opportunity zones as well. So it's important to have that notion of a plan that leads potentially to a market prospectus. Um, and if you don't have that, PD role again is to think through, well, we don't have a plan, we don't have a prospectus. Is there a role we can play as a catalyst by, by potentially providing some funding to do this? Uh, we don't know what the current administration is gonna do with opportunity zones. I think all of us could potentially speculate and to tell me I'm wrong, but we don't think they're going away anytime soon, that there may be some enhancements um, and, and some tweaking, particularly in terms of uh, public reporting. But opportunity zones are around, uh, will be around, and they're, I wouldn't say here to stay, but they'll be around for the next few years in my crystal ball. Having said that, it's begging the question, it's not just opportunity zone funds. How do we leverage even new market tax credits and historic tax credits and all of these other incentives is communities need to be thinking about this. Um, in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, there's a regional planning council uh, that actually got some EDA, Economic Development Administration funding uh, to do a capital audit is to take a look at capital flows for both public uh, uh, markets and private markets. And you know how well is the area leveraging federal and state resources? What are the banks doing? How well are they uh, responding to the needs? What are the needs? Um, so I, I think that that, that that study is about to uh, get underway, but other communities have done that type of capital audit as well. And again, I would encourage CPD uh, recipients to think through this is looking at their system, what's missing? Well, we don't have a prospectus, we don't have a plan. I'm pretty sure then you really don't know how well we're doing in terms of leveraging. And, and that's a place where you can step in and be more of a catalyst and activist uh, to get things jump started. Thank you very, very much, Jim. I think everything that you said makes complete sense. And I, you know, we're going to transition to some questions in the next five minutes or so. Um, but I wanted to just based on the comments that everybody um, ha has shared so far, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. So, so Joey, please feel free to, to punt uh, if you'd like. But just based on what you're hearing and the ways in which we've heard Catalyst, we've heard um, you know, convener, we've heard technical assistance, we've also heard flexible capital to help support these projects. Um, just curious, Joey, if you could, could share with the group how that syncs up with um, the various uses for uh, CPD funds potentially in Opportunity Zone projects, either directly or indirectly. Maybe I put him on the spot there. Sorry about that. Um, I'll let him jump in during the Q&A. But I, I wanted to, to just offer that up simply because there's a lot, of, um, a lot of commonalities between the various uses that we hear on the screen and the different, um, the different uh, uses that the panelists here have highlighted in one form or another. So I think with that, what I'll do is I'll just ask if each panelist could share, based on your Opportunity Zone experience over the last three years, you know, kind of one clear um, lesson learned um, that you think might be beneficial to the group. It can be a lesson learned or I guess a key takeaway that you'd like the group to take with and then we'll transition to Q&A. And we'll start, maybe we'll start with uh, Lamont, if that's okay. Yeah, I would, uh, I guess one key takeaway um, from, uh, our trainings, our convenings is, is, you know, folks really understanding uh, the assets that they have in their region 
Um, you know, uh, Peter talked about the, the opportunity exchange and actually from a statewide perspective, we, we've done the same thing. Uh, Peter's tool is great. We just, we couldn't use, utilize Peter uh, because of some, some administrative things on my end, but uh, helping folks understand what their regional assets are. Really, uh, whether it's a natural asset, right? Uh, I, I've even heard uh, some community members say we don't have anything. Oh, well, you do. You have, you know, walking trails. You have, you know, uh, natural assets like rivers or streams or, or parks nearby. Uh, you have unused buildings. Uh, we've even uh, gotten to the point to, to have communities think through what are the government-owned or publicly owned buildings and land that you may have at your disposal that are in opportunity zones or even green fields or brown fields and start formulating a potential plan about what could be done. Uh, and even uh, you know, helping communities think through the operating business component, especially from like a main street perspective, you know, there are a, a lot of opportunities within our state because we have some regional assets that are incubating and accelerating small businesses and a lot of these uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs we're incubating want to go back home and live. And some of their areas are small, they're rural or maybe urban, but they're wanting to relocate back in an opportunity zone. So just thinking through how that could be potentially leveraged from a CDP, uh, um, from, from the use of HUD funds, like what could be done, you know, from a Main Street perspective, uh, streetscaping, uh, uh, you know, lights, uh, even if you're incubating a small business, could you help them, you know, buy a delivery truck that's in an OZ census tract or buy equipment? It's really trying to figure out what, how can you live, uh, leverage the asset that is in your community? Because we have, again, 176 of these OZ census tracts across 75 counties. And there are, and every last one of them are surrounded by regional assets. So really it's just, you know, helping folks and communities think through these, these are the you know, the opportunities that you have and really look at the OZ from a regional perspective. Excellent. Um, thanks for sharing that, that um, takeaway with us. Um, Mark, is there a takeaway that you would share with the group or lesson learned based on, on your experience today? Yeah, I think I've had a lot, um, but uh, you know, I actually, um, I, I like what Lamont said about assets. I, th I think that is a, a, a great one. Um, you know, and assets come in many shapes and forms. I mean, I live in Greenville, South Carolina. We had a bridge downtown that went right through the middle of the town, perfectly fine bridge, and they decided to tear it down because we have a waterfall in the middle of our downtown. And they decided they wanted to put a pedestrian bridge there. And by doing that, it sparked revitalization for the whole downtown. So thinking through those types of assets, and at the time people thought they were crazy. Why are you going to tear down a perfectly good bridge? Why are you going to spend all that money on the pedestrian bridge? But it sparked so much. Um, so thinking about, you know, may, maybe the resources, you know, physical resources you have, um, thinking about, you know, a lot of communities don't realize that they do have land bank land, they do have municipal owned buildings, they have lots of different real assets that could be leveraged to do projects. Um, there's a great, a great book called uh, The New Localism by Bruce Katz um, that really highlights that and talks about different strategies and how you can basically leverage all the assets that you currently have to get the assets that you want, um, whether it be you know housing or new office or new new municipal buildings. Um, so I think there's a great strategy there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the other big one for me was uh, the municipal model. So you know, all right, I can do that in every county. I can you know we could do a fire station, we could do broadband, we could do sewer lines. I've been asked to do sewer lines, so we can do that all in an OZ fund and. For me, it's great because I can go back to investors and I can say, hey, we've got this municipal fund. And, and basically, for the first time in your life, the government's going to owe you money. And they get really excited about that, even though the returns aren't you know, as high as the other ones. But if you look at kind of a balanced OZ portfolio, having a municipal piece in there makes a lot of sense. So those are, I was probably more than one, but sorry. Anyway, that, those are a couple of takeaways. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Jim, is there anything that you would leave us with before we turn to Q&A? Um. A couple, uh, just uh, the, the, the key one, I think has been said numerous times, but it's worth underlying and emphasizing. If we're looking to drive impact, we often need, these projects often need multiple subsidy sources. These deals are complex. 
Um, and so you're not going to be the only one in with CPD. You're going to see five, six, seven, eight other sources, depending on the project. And understanding that 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 mix, that blend of sources is really important. So we've already gone through that a number of times. So I'm going to take the liberty of adding one more. And I think one of the key things about what we've learned, a, a positive thing, because there are a couple of negatives as well, but I'll say a takeaway from my experience is that we're seeing actors now, we're seeing stakeholders involved with community development, with mission-driven investment and development that we've never seen before. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about, and I'll be very quick about this, is that you can separate very broadly institutional funds, large national funds or regional funds. For instance, PNC Bank has an opportunity zone fund, and they work on behalf of their wealthy uh, uh, customers who have uh, capital gains uh, th that they want to uh, protect. Uh, but maybe, and Mark, Peter, you guys know better than I, Lamont, with your experience, maybe half of them are what I call one-off funds. The uh, wealthy doctor or attorney who has a million dollar capital gains in a stock market and his, and his or her accountant says, put it in an opportunity zone fund, you can get 10 10% off, so to speak. Uh, oh, okay, great. So he or she creates a one-time fund, and because he or she is local, they may be looking for a project that they can keep an eye on. So you know that that makes it that doctor or wealthy attorney, if we can carry out the example, they haven't been engaged with community development before, and that's an exciting thing: is is being able to share impact uh, investing impact uh, development. I think that's an excellent point. And I think it's a great segue to get, you know, kind of a last takeaway from, from Peter uh, with this idea that um, potentially that one-off um, retail or high net worth investor that's had a gain event, they may be going to a place like an exchange marketplace to understand what's happening in a community that they care about. Um, or in some in, in some platform similar to that. So Peter, I, I'll leave it to you before we turn to Q&A to kind of give us, um, you know, kind of a key takeaway or lesson learned or tip as we think about this moving forward. Yeah, thank you. I'll certainly echo. I think we see a lot of this local motivated, um, locally motivated outreach on the Opportunity Exchange. A lot of the places that we work with uh, receive a, a good degree of, of inquiry from folks saying, hey, I've lived in this community for a long time. I'm, I'm really passionate about seeing what's going to happen here. And I didn't know this work was going on. Like, how can I get connected to it? Um, and so I do think that creating avenues for that type of visibility and connectivity at a local level is critical. The other thing I'll echo, which builds upon the comments of the other three panelists, is thinking about this work, uh, you know, thinking about this work that we've been talking about of asset identification and building a narrative for your community around opportunity zones is going to have spillover benefits for how you think about approaching other development finance incentives that are out there. As James said, thinking about this from the context of new market tax credits or otherwise, there are a lot of ways that this type of coordinated prioritized approach um, can, can provide benefit and drive forward your agenda um, in other arenas that you're working on as well. And I think that sometimes we, I've seen communities get frustrated when this work is done in the opportunity zone silo because they don't necessarily, for a variety of factors, experience the uptake and momentum that they were hoping for. And so the, the energy dies out. But instead, framing the motivation for this work in a more broad context and realizing that it will have applicability in a whole variety of settings, not just opportunity zones, um, is a way uh, to frame these conversations locally in a way that can help get past some, perhaps, the skepticism that you may confront as you, you know, pitch folks on having an opportunity zone, you know, based conversation. Um, but instead, framing it more generally uh, can sometimes be helpful for, for building that buy-in and momentum. Um, so I'll echo, I'll echo some comments that have been made previously as sort of one of my takeaway points there. Thank you so much, Peter. And I think um, it's a great point for us to end on before we pivot to Q&A. Um, and I, I do want to highlight that, you know, in Peter's comments, something that we've seen before is not only the projects that are the Opportunity Zone project itself, but they're, they're part of a broader plan. And so maybe they're, you know, positioned near to next to a low income housing tax credit project or a new markets tax credit project with ground floor retail and some catalytic um, business, uh, you know, business tenants that would be there. So this idea that there's an effort on the ground that is signaling to various stakeholders that um, this engineering of appreciation, this investment and level of intentional care to redevelopment with the community in mind 
really does resonate and does offer benefit that extends beyond just that one OZ project in and of itself. Um, so I think that's a great point to transition to. So I'll, I'll pivot to Orlando um, to take us to Q&A and, and, and give me a sense here of how much time we have and where we should start. Sure, thanks, Alicia. Um, so we still have uh, we still have a few minutes. We're ending at twelve fifty-five. Um, we have a couple of questions coming through uh, that we could go ahead and start. Uh, one just came through from Rachel Williams. If a private developer partners with a local community housing development organization or CHOTO, uh, does that provide any additional opportunities to use CDBG funding? And I think this may be a question uh, if Joey is also on the line. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think what you're getting at here is that Chodos do when you're when a Chodo is um, taking on a project or a community is having a Chodo act as a sub recipient, then it opens up the ability to do new construction of housing with CDBG and Section 108 funds. And so in that sense, if you are working with a CHOTO, it, it would expand the opportunities of the use of funds and that it opens up that eligible activity. Um, I think that, you know, involving a CHOTO is a great idea as a community partner. And um, I would just, like with any of these projects, encourage you to bring in HUD early on so that HUD can work with you on all the program requirements. Um, I'm not sure if any of our field staff on the line wants to chime in here, but, or um, Cindy, if you wanted to chime in and it, if that wasn't the answer you were looking for, please please feel free. Thank you, Joey. Uh, we also had a request um, from Dr. Tim Washington. Uh, if Peter can mention the Opportunity Zone projects again, please. Yeah, I referenced a couple of resources. Happy to reiterate them here. One would be looking for investment prospectuses. Uh, so you could Google Opportunity Zone investment prospectus. If you Google the Accelerator for America Opportunity Zone investment prospectus, you'll find your way to a template that they have. Um, for project listings, I referenced a website at Lamont referenced one that Tennessee has. So you can, you can check that out. Um, I referenced one that Erie, Pennsylvania has. If you go to our website, theopportunityexchange.com and click on our community partners tab, you'll see the websites that all of our community partners maintain. So there's a few examples there as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we have another question from George uh, Mensa. Um, it was indicated that special rents for those in the neighborhood who might be displaced by the projects uh, were provided. How do you specifically ensure that residents of the neighborhood have access to this project when CPD funds are involved without having a neighborhood preference because of fair housing? So I know this question is directed at the panelists, but I just want to um... If it's okay, Orlando, just sort of chime in and, and just clarify. Uh, so is the question really asking, how do you prevent uh, or, or mitigate against displacement with these types of opportunity zone projects while still providing uh, you know, access to housing per fair housing standards? George, is that, uh, is that sort of where you're going with this question specifically? Or are you looking more for information on rental assistance? And Orlando, I don't know if George will respond in the chat or come off mute, but um, while he's, he's responding, I'll, I'll make a comment and then I'll turn it to the panelists. Um, you know, some of the examples that we've seen where we're thinking about making sure that local residents are not being, um, you know, forgotten uh, as a new project is coming online in an opportunity zone, particularly when it's affordable housing or a mixed income, um, you know, a new development is really thinking about some of the requirements that are tied to pieces that are filling out the capital stack. So you will see projects where inclusionary housing requirements for certain levels of AMI are still a part of the fabric of the programming of that project. You might see a project where there's a property tax exemption or pilot or some other subsidy source um, that has similar affordability requirements that are looking to um, uptake and really make sure that it's, it's reaching those 
folks that are part of that demographic. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll also share and, and I, I would welcome anyone else's feedback is, you know, as an intermediary partner who's part of a fund or who is, uh, you know, a stakeholder in a, in a community, prioritizing and working on projects and directing attention to those projects where that's not a factor. So something that we at Enterprise do is we look to not support projects that are actively displacing folks if that's, if that's apparent, if that's clear. Uh, you know, if it's something where um, you're increasing density and it's a site where there's something on it, a key question is who is who's using that site now? What is it used for? What is the impact? And and I and I you know I offer that on the one hand that doesn't mean that you from your position or your organization can um, affect what another opportunity zone um, stakeholder may be doing in their fund or their projects, but it is an opportunity to start to signal what it is that, you know, how you choose to demonstrate and what you'll be a part of, and also the role that a grantee or other stakeholder can have in driving attention to the projects that are doing good work um, is, is really something that's important. So it's, it's not a perfect solution, but I hope that provides a little bit of, of insight um, from that perspective. Thank you. George has raised his hand, so I'm going to put him on, uh, take him off of mute. Uh, good afternoon, Go ahead, everyone. Um, my question was mostly about the fact that one of the panelists did mention that um, in opportunity, when they go to an opportunity zone, uh, they try not to displace tenants and that they make sure that tenants have the ability to uh, rent um, in the properties at a discount rate. I know that when we were discussing our opportunity zone prospectus with um, community residents, one of the issues that came up was displacement. Most of them felt that um, opportunities don't bring about displacement in our, in our communities. And so some of the tools that we thought we could use to prevent that is neighborhood preference. But we know that uh, the whole regulations in fair housing does not allow us to be able to provide any preference uh, for residents in the neighborhood. So my question is, how did that panelist or how was that panelist able to do that? That was my question. Thank you. Uh, sure. So, I mean, from our standpoint, a lot of times we're tying into the communities pretty early. Um, I mean, we're in the South, so um, talking to some of the local churches is uh, pretty helpful for us. So we talk to the local preachers. Um, it's a great way to tie into the community, get to know some folks really fast. And um, so, so it lets us know who's there, because uh, otherwise it's kind of, you know, it almost seems anonymous. There's just houses next door and there's people that live there, right? Versus we know um, that Miss Bell lives there and we, you know, she, she's uh, been here for, for 40 years and she knows everybody in the neighborhood. And um, so we find that um, it's nice to, to get involved from, from that standpoint. And then um, as Alicia hinted to, sometimes when you're working with different cities, uh, sometimes they'll put in, you'll say, hey, you know, we've got the project here. We've been able to put in maybe 10% affordable um, if, if you guys helped us maybe on property taxes, we wouldn't take any of that money, but we'll put it directly towards putting, you know, building more affordable units. So maybe that takes us to 20 or 30%. Um, and then what we'll try and do is, is basically flag those for folks that are in the neighborhood. Um, so we'll go to them first and, and basically say, you know, Hey, we've just opened up these units to rent. If you're interested, you should, you should put in your application right now. So, so we give them basically, we let them know before anyone else, um, even though it is open to the public, you know, if they go to the website. Um, so it's a way to get them in uh, a little faster than everyone else and then also kind of earmark it for them. So we just think that's a good model. And, and I mean, these people have been in these neighborhoods for a very long time and, uh, you know, removing them from the neighborhood doesn't, in our mind, make a lot of sense and is not in the spirit of this program. Thank you, Mark. Were there any other panelists that wanted to comment on um, George's question? I'll say that um, it could be a good idea that, to think about utilizing the HUD neighborhood revitalization strategy area here too, which opens up, like I mentioned, the possibility of streamlining some of the HUD reporting requirements and could allow for targeting funds in those areas. I think also thinking about aligning your, and I know Alicia, you were speaking to this earlier, but aligning your consolidated plan, your uh, fair housing plan, so your assessment of fair housing, um, you thinking about aligning those plans with the development you want to see in opportunity zones will really help 
with how you can prioritize those funds. And then like I've been mentioning, bringing HUD in early in the process so that we can work with you to talk about the best ways to layer in the HUD financing. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Um, and I, I will also say just as an example, in case it's helpful, and I appreciate this is different in every single market, but I have seen a number of developers working in opportunity zones that thoughtfully leverage um, vouchers and leverage project-based vouchers to try and also start to make sure that they're really being thoughtful around fair housing, but also creating a mechanism um, to make sure that the lowest, most underserved folks in terms of income level can still benefit from a better quality product when it comes to housing at a minimum. So I'll just share that, that that is a strategy I've seen a number of times from developers. Orlando, do we have another question for the group? We do. We have another question that came in from Matt Ojala. Uh, multiple panelists have discussed how complex OZ projects can be. However, many governments are stretched thin with staff and resources that may be necessary to help enable projects. Can any of the panelists speak about the timeline for putting together an OZ project and level of engagement necessary for government staff to be engaged throughout the process? So maybe I will, uh, again, I don't mean to put any of the panelists on the spot, but given that the question is around, you know, what is the timeline and level of engagement for government staff? I imagine that probably looks different in different places. So, you know, I don't know, Lamont, is there, can you shed any light, at least from your experience with respect to how government staff is engaged and, and, and what that looks like in terms of the life cycle of the deals that you've seen? Yeah, and, and so, and to your point, each each case is different. So, I mean, there's been, you know, for example, uh, in the city of Knoxville, you know, they they did an adaptive reuse project, um, the old Supreme Court building uh, that that's near uh, uh, a growing part of of Knoxville. So, each each community is different, and where you know certain certain jurisdictions uh, are jumping at the chance for that type of development, you know, uh, just some some entities are, are a little bit more uh, ready, uh, ready to go and they have the wherewithal in terms of administrative infrastructure, uh, in terms of staff to get things done. Uh, it just depends because again, I think being, it didn't hurt being near uh, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, it didn't hurt that again, you have a number of different um, things happening there from a local government standpoint, uh, just being very uh, innovative. Uh, they, for example, launched their own uh, OZ, uh, uh, their own site in terms of just helping uh, residents identify where the OZ census tracts are. So even before the state put out its platform, they had already launched theirs uh, and had already been, you know, looking, looking at, um, uh, looking to pull potential investors in uh, and, and really uh, with us, they actually helped us uh, host um, one of our OZ regional sessions in Knoxville. So every every uh, locale locale is different, um, and again, it just a lot of it goes back to the education and information component. Um, some were scared away uh, by by the incentive because it, it is it's tax law, it's it's cumbersome. But once you begin to really understand what it can do, um, you know some cities jumped at it more or quickly than others. So. Um, a, a lot of it is, frankly, you know, we're still getting communities reaching out to us um, as our department, which is tasked with the re recruitment and retention of businesses. They're doing a great job and affordable housing and workforce housing is a huge need within our state. So we're now starting to get this slow uh, uh, influx of questions about the OZ incentive and how it can be leveraged for workforce housing and affordable housing. So I think just through some, you know, just natural economic development, uh, what's happening in our state is folks are starting to look at what are the other development finance tools at their disposal. And uh, the OZ incentive is one. So we, we're starting just to see kind of a, I would call it, yeah, it's organic. Uh, in addition to the forms we're having, it's just kind of out of necessity because of the job growth and companies moving uh, to Tennessee. So hopefully that, that helps to answer some of the question. Thank you, Lamont. Um, and, and Jim, I, I would turn to you just to see if you had any thoughts as well in terms of, you know, how engaged is, is that government partner uh, or stakeholder throughout the process? Is there such thing as engaging them too early 
Um, or, you know, is it something where you're engaging them at different points, depending on where you are and putting your project together? You're on mute, Jim. Sorry about that. Uh, I think Lamont uh, summarized it well in terms of it's, it's going to vary and it's going to depend uh, from community to community, from deal to deal, uh, and the role of CPD in, in its uh, incentives. Uh, some communities, particularly larger ones, uh, Miami, Atlanta, uh, and others have received funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to hire a full-time chief opportunity zone officer. So that individual plays that role of that's his or her job is to shepherd the deal and walk it through. So that's all he or she is supposed to be doing uh, ostensibly. But I also know some communities have said, you know what, we don't necessarily believe that government should be playing this activist role. We think the market should come to us and by deal by deal, we'll look at it. They need to make the specific request. We're not gonna play that, uh, that intermediary role, if you will. And you know, there's, it, it's not a judgment, but that's the reality that some cities feel that way, maybe from budgetary concerns or from a philosophical uh, approach to uh, governing. So that, that's gonna be different than others, but uh, Lamont is absolutely correct. Each one is gonna be very different if you, and also depends on your staffing. If you're the person in CPD in, or, or the in CDBG department and handling home and everything else, I, I'm not sure how much time you're gonna be able to spend on putting together OZ deals. It's gonna to be tough enough trying to figure out how does your incentive work you're probably going to need somebody else that is packaging the five, six different sources uh, to make it happen. Let me let me just add, uh, Alicia. You know, one of the things that we're uh, to to Jim's point, you know, that's effectively the position that as a state, you know, we're taking at Tennessee is really the kind of the market driven approach. But from a convening standpoint, you know, we're working on a couple of things um, that 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 will impact. Uh, the north or northeast corridor of the state where um, you're, you're able to convene um, local communities uh, with investors uh, and, and there are potential grant resources that would be available to help undergird that process. We're recognizing, right, you know, we can, we can do more collectively from that convening standpoint where you're bringing you know, a CDFI and other uh, potential funds to the table with grant resources to move the needle on projects. But it still goes back to, you know, being ready, having potentially uh, OZ ready or shovel ready or investment ready projects. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're doing uh, in the Northeast corridor of Tennessee. Uh, we, we started doing that in West Tennessee with the prospectus development where we're convening county and city leaders around, uh, you know, uh, developing that prospectus. But again, it's, we, we, we're doing this uh, delicate dance of not, you know, the state not undergirding, but providing the convening power of the right resources, whether it's federal partners, whether it's a CDFI, whether it's an OZ fund to talk through, you know, here's, you know, one, help us understand what resources and what census tracts are in your community and what projects can get done. So it's really just really kind of a, a continuum uh, or this ecosystem of, of development, thinking through uh, what can get done in, in certain regions within Tennessee. So uh, we, we understand the challenge. I think we understand the challenge, but really pulling those local leaders together, elected officials, and sometimes even our state legislators to talk about the incentive and here's what we can do to help move a project forward, so. Thank you for adding that additional color. I think that's really helpful. And I, and I would also just remind people that uh, this is a long-term program and the opportunity to start putting together a complex in-demand needed project for your community today and needing to take 12 months to figure it out if that's what it is, there are a lot of projects that with an enterprise that we may take a look at and see where those partners have been trying to put that together for you know, well over a year. And so as something that I, you know, I do think is at least 
worth pointing towards uh, for encouragement and also to highlight that this really is long term is that um, different funds, different um, you know, intermediaries that have funds, investors who are looking for direct investment opportunities, for as long as the program is still viable to look towards that incentive from an investor perspective, um, you know, we're at least encouraged that they'll continue to do so. And a lot of the players that are involved and are looking to identify projects are looking to do so for the long term. Um, so I think it's important just to keep that, that in mind that shovel ready is essential, but there are also projects that were not shovel ready 12 months ago when they were brought to us initially, and now they've come back around because they are. Um, and so that's, that's also a part of the process in addition to what uh, both Lamont and Jim shared. Orlando, I know we're, we're running close to time, so I will turn it to you for some additional questions and to, to keep us on track schedule-wise. Thank you. We are actually right at time. Uh, we had a couple of questions come through. Uh, some questions we might be able to answer uh, um, outside of this panel discussion too. Um, we had one more question that I thought was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, how do HUD programs support equity and inclusion to long-term uh, residents in opportunity zones in uh, I'll take a little bit. So for that question, Joey. maybe we'll turn it to Joey. Yeah, Joey, I think you're on mute. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, it's got to happen. Everybody's got to talk while on mute, I guess, in a virtual meeting. Um, so I think I mentioned a couple of ideas in my slides, but I, I think the way that putting HUD funds into an opportunity zone project really does assure that there are some outcomes that are that are achieved that are beneficial to the community and the current residents of the opportunity zone. I talked a lot about um, how different programs can be used for rental assistance, home buyer assistance, and rehabilitation programs that allow those who are currently in their house to stay in their house in the opportunity zone, which I think definitely supports equity and inclusion. A lot of our programs do have requirements to serve low and moderate income individuals. So um, that's through housing, through job creation, or through area benefit activities. So um, making the surrounding area better for those who currently live there. I think um, I mentioned a couple times just offhand about park projects or uh, environmental remediation projects that could support opportunity zone projects. And I think all of those could have a benefit to uh, increase equity and inclusion in these areas. So I think just by utilizing HUD funds with the idea that HUD funds do support low and moderate income individuals, you're real, you really are ensuring that the project does have that kind of outcome. Um, and there are many more examples I think that we could we could throw out there. So uh, if you wanted to talk more specifically about uh, how to incorporate equity and inclusion into your plan or your opportunities on prospectus, you know, please reach out. Wonderful. Thank you, Joey. Um, I think at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our to our last speaker to close us out. So I'd like to, to pass over to um, Mr. Michael Browder, Sr., who's the Deputy Regional Administrator of Region 4 for HUD for some closing remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Am I heard okay? We can hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, as HUD Region 4 Deputy Region Administrator, I speak for all the Region 4 team to say thank you for the work that you have accomplished here today. The listening, learning, and exchange of ideas and actions going forward will serve as a platform of positive change for opportunity zones throughout the Southeast. We look forward to Thursday, day two of the Region 4 Opportunity Zone Roundtable as we collectively continue the momentum that we've achieved. The difference in the Opportunity Zone communities, families, and lives of those we mutually serve. This would not be possible without the leadership and participation, without your leadership and participation. I would like to also especially thank and recognize at this time the contribution of the HUD Office Community Planning and Development, CPD, Joseph Bietti and Director Adrian Fields and CPD directors across the, the region. As we, as well as the Inter, Inter, Enterprise Community Partners uh, Incorporated, Orlando Velez and Jonathan Tarr, and of course our outstanding panelists, 
and HUD Office Field Policy and Management FPM team, consisting of Shay Johnson, who is our Georgia Operations Director, and our Field Office Directors, Kenneth Free, the Birmingham, Field, Alabama Field Office Director, Christine Foy, our Columbia, South Carolina Field Office Director, Roosevelt Grant, our Greensboro Field Office Director, Jerry G. Magruder, Esquire, Jacksonville, Mississippi Field Office Director. Dr. Elisa Scott Ford, Jackson Field Field Office Director, and uh, Sir Norman Mitchell, Tennessee Field Office Director, and Peter Jackson Esquire, Louisville, Kentucky Field Office Director, and finally our Louis Brolet, our, our Miami Field Office Director. I would like to also acknowledge our, our Region 4 Regional Opportunity Zone Coordinator, Avir Benito. As we come to the close of day one of HUD's Region 4 Opportunity Zone Roundtable, I would like to remind and invite each of you to join us again for another Productive Opportunity Zone Roundtable session on Thursday, May 6th, from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be addressing Opportunity Zone investments in COVID, establishing an Opportunity Zone strategy. And we'll also be fortunate to hear from Michelle Perez, HUD, Office, Field of Policy and, Op and Management, Assistant, De 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 Assistant, De De Assistant Deputy Secretary as our closing speaker. It promised to be another informative and action-packed session. Thanks again for your participation and con contribution to HUD Region 4 Opportunity Zone Roundtable. And we look forward to reconnecting with you all again on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes day one of our roundtable for Region 4. Thank you all for joining, and we hope to see you Thursday, May 6th.